for the record, once we go back to council chambers, I have no idea how I'm going to do this without snacks. Brian, you never did it without snacks. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I never did it without snacks. More snacks. Thank you, Marcia. Mayor, you're ready to begin. You're muted, Mayor. You're muted, Mayor. Again, I'd like to welcome you all to the City <laughs> Council agenda, or I'm sorry, to the City Council regular session meeting of June 30th, 2020 via remote access. Um, I'd like to go ahead and cal call the uh, regular session to order. Can we start with the roll call, please? Mayor Bagley. Here. Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Edoggle Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Can't unmute. Aaron, you here? He is here, but he's having trouble unmuting. There, go ahead. Here. Council member. There we go. Council member Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, let's go ahead and start with the pledge. Marcia, do you want to lead us this, this time tonight? Sure, why not? Everybody great, has to follow. That's right. I pledge, so, I pledge, pledge allegiance. allegiance. To, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. and, to, and the to the republic for which it, for which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. all. All right. Thank you very much. Um, all right, just a quick reminder, anyone wishing to speak during first call public invited to be heard or in a public item or hearing item, that would be item nine. You'll need to watch the live stream of the meeting and then call that number 1-669-900-6833 and enter that meeting ID. And then only, then we will call on you. We'll identify you by the last four numbers of your phone number. And then uh, you'll get your three minutes and then we'll go on to the next person. So that's how that's gonna work. Um, let's go ahead uh, to go to item 3A. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes of June 16th, 2020? So moved. I'll second it. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, agenda revisions and submission of documents and motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items. Council Member Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, I may be the only one that's thinking about uh, this being a good idea, but I'm going to make the motion. Uh, we're all aware that we had a uh, ballot question fail last November on extending uh, lease periods from 20 to 30 years in the city charter. Uh, it seems to me that if there was ever a time when we ought to um, be a more aggressive in the pursuit and the enabling of public-private partnerships, it will be in the post-pandemic, post not post-COVID, but the post-pandemic period. Um, that, that ballot question failed. There's no money tied to it. The reason it failed, I think we did, and those who care about this in the community uh, did a poor job of explaining why this would make sense in the long run. Uh, I think uh, our, our um, performing arts groups in town, uh, anybody who's interested in, in, in investing in Longmont um, sees the, the wisdom of creating lease periods that would approximate mortgages. None of us would, when we got started with our homes, at least were willing, I suspect, to take out mortgages that lasted for 20 years. We were looking for 30 year mortgages because of how you amortize, amortize costs. And I think it'll be a mistake if we don't put that before the public again and, and then do better outreach with those in the community who care about this and make the case that, that it's in our long-term interest to, to enable 
longer piecing or to permit longer piecing uh, leasing periods to enable public private partnerships should we choose to pursue them. So I'm gonna move that we direct staff to bring back to council a question, uh, uh, the, the same kind of question we put on the ballot last year that would require council approval. Second. All right, we have a motion on the table to uh, place once again, the question of increasing city leases to 30 years. Um, do we have any debate on the issue? Um, Councilmember, we're gonna go with Councilmember Christensen first and then Councilmember Peck. Um, I do understand why uh, I think most of us have 30 year mortgages. Uh, I do understand this. I just question bringing it back before um, bringing it back to a vote at this particular time when people's minds are on other things. Um, and I would rather see it come back in two years when I think it has a better chance of passing. Um, you know, I, I'm not opposed to it. I just don't don't think this is really the time. I understand why various people who want to invest in the city would like it to be back now, but given that it was already voted down just recently, I I don't know that it's a wise thing to bring it back at this time. That's all I'm saying. Councilmember Member Peck. Um, I agree with that, but my concern, my other concern is because we're bringing, you want to bring it back so soon is, uh, are we going to be able to um, reach out to people and truly explain what it's about? I'm not sure that the public understood what this was really about. So uh, I'm questioning the staff's ability, not, not their, the time-wise, the ability to uh, reach out and market this correctly, so that so that the residents actually understand what we're doing and why. So um, I do think, with everything that's going on, perhaps we should wait. I I, I understand it as well, and and why we should do it. I just don't want it to fail a second time because we haven't given it enough time or explained it correctly. So that's my concern. So, so I'm not going to vote for it right now. Councilmember Martin. I think that we are debating the subject rather than the motion, which is to consider the subject. I think that it's critically important to rebuilding an economy and that therefore we should at least have the debate while there's still time to get it on the ballot. I also, um, now that we all understand that the public didn't understand um, in 2018, um, uh, I think that it'll be a clean slate. I doubt if anybody even remembers because it seemed like such a, a puzzle. But if it's explained correctly, I don't think it'll seem like a puzzle. And I think everyone wants our economy back. I don't see any other hands. I, I'm not. I don't. I'm not ready to debate the issue right now. But I will uh, vote to bring it back so we can have the discussion. I think it's an important enough topic to at least discuss, and then uh, we can vote it down later if we we want to. But I'd I'd, I'd be for putting out an agenda at least discussing it. Um, I would have. If we were discussing it tonight, I would probably bring up the fact that there are some very influential political uh, uh, behind the scene figures that don't want this to happen, and I uh, would want some assurance that that we could overcome that uh, 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 obstacle. But anyway, um, seeing no one else, Councilman Peck. Um, I don't know, Mayor Bagley, why you, you brought that up, that there are behind the scenes political figures that don't want this to come back. I want it to come back. I just wanna make sure we do it correctly. So, no, hold on, wait, wait, I, I wasn't talking about you, Councilmember Peck. I'm saying that there are people who advocated against it, none of the council members. I'm just saying there are people in the community who were vocally against it. And I'd want to make sure we figure out a way to, to, to overcome what we've faced last time. That's all. I wasn't okay, implying I, anybody here. I'll vote to discuss, put it on the agenda to discuss. 
Thank you. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, vote on it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. And I look forward to vigorous debate. Councilmember uh, Christensen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, on Monday night, uh, we had a, there was a, uh, another listening session for early childhood education. And uh, it was very, very illuminating to me. And it made me realize how, you know, we all are having very, very different experiences of this. And um, it made me realize uh, how very different the experiences of people who have small children, people who are essential workers, people who are in the daycare industry are having a really nearly impossible time. Um, and they could use some help. And I know we're spending our contingency money down, but that's for emergencies. This is an emergency. And since we have a bit of money there, even though it's not a huge amount of money, I would suggest that we contribute several thousand dollars of that toward the, um, the early childhood education with the um, group in Longmont with the idea that they would distribute it evenly to um, the daycare centers that are having so much trouble. Okay, anyway, do we have no more money left? No, no, I was actually going to jump in um, to say a couple of things we're working on. We have the 200,000 that council set aside um, in terms of early childhood, oh. early childhood programs. And okay. we also have the CARES funding Oh. that we're looking at. And so what staff yeah. did um, this week, similar to what we did on the business side, we um, put out an uh, essentially a, trying to get an unmet needs assessment with all of the early childhood care providers oh, to really good. see okay. what they need um, so that we can be more targeted. Uh, that was gonna be something that I was gonna update you all on the COVID oh, piece, good. but it works now. So once we get that okay. back, then we'll be able to figure it out. One of the big issues we're seeing is the need for PPE. And we're trying to, to look at it in a similar way that we were talking about with businesses. So okay. that's part of it. Yeah, because they are, I mean, thank you, Harold. I um, I wasn't aware that the some of the CARES money was going to be able to go to the early childhood people. And that's good. So, okay. I, I, I'll withdraw that until we figure out how much is going toward them because it, it's, uh, they're having... <sighs> such a hard time and you know all every one of these daycare centers is worried that if one person gets sick the whole thing will shut down and these are all just for essential workers the yeah anyway we we all know this but it's it's um anything we can do to do that but to to help them would be helpful but um let's wait i'll, I'll wait until um you update us thanks All right, oh, who else? Councilman Martin, you need to wave your hand harder. I'm kidding, Thank you, you wave it pretty hard. I just didn't see. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, our uh, Public Works and Natural Resources Division has been doing yeoman's work um, on keeping our public open spaces uh, operational. They've been facing a large number of public health and safety issues around it because of the extraordinary crowding um, that's resulting from people having flexible working hours and people not being able to do anything but local um, outdoor recreation. Um, and I think that it would be helpful at some point while it's still summer if the public and the council got a full report of what's being done. I don't want to make a huge amount of work for them. So, you know, I'm pretty sure these are pretty eloquent people. If they can just talk to it, I'd be perfectly happy. And, you know, uh, four weeks after we're through with the climate action task force would be plenty good time if they don't want to do it sooner. 
but I just think it would be useful for us to have the information that um, to, to tell our constituents when they write to us about it and to get this case in front of the public so that maybe people will um, be a little more measured in, in their um, in the care they take when they use these public amenities. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Councilwoman Martin. Um, actually, that was what I was going to suggest something similar, but um, mainly it is coming from McIntosh Lake at this point. Uh, what I would like, and I was going to make a motion to have um, either put it on a study session agenda or have a special session for city council as well as the parks department and public works to have a, a, an open discussion of ideas actually as to what we can all do to help. Because um, I think that as we've been getting these emails that the council itself has, has ideas as to how we can work together to make this happen. So I am going to make a motion that we, uh, re that we put on a study session or a special session, uh, staff's choice in the next couple of weeks or uh, before August to have a discussion with a report with council having ideas and something we can actually give to the public. Um, so that's my motion, that we direct staff to have either a special session or on a study session, a, uh, a report and council input on what is happening to our natural resources and um, a step forward. I will support that and second it with the stipulation that it needs to be a study session so it happens on Tuesday night when people are watching. Okay, uh, I agree with that. Um, I've noticed though, Councilwoman Martin, that when we had our other special session because it is the COVID and people are at home and they're not working that they're more tuned into uh, turning, tuning into another meeting on a different night. They're not as busy and they're at home. So that's why I wanted to leave it up to uh, the city staff because I don't know what they have scheduled for study sessions at this point. So um, I don't know. Do, what do you think, Councilman Martin, since you're the one, do you still want it to be on a Tuesday night? I prefer a Tuesday night, but I don't want that to be a reason to stop it because I do think it's important. Um, so, you know, again, I, I would like a, a goodly audience for it because I think the word needs to be spread and the word, people need to understand what the staff are dealing with. Okay, um, so I'll take that as an amendment to the motion that we have it on a Tuesday night. Thank you. And I do second. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, there's a motion and a second to bring back uh, and have a discussion on a Tuesday night study session, the envir environmental impacts of what's going on out at Mac Macintosh Lake. And uh, I would assume that would also incorporate what we might need to do it out at Union, but uh, Dr. Waters. I just, I just want to clarify, is this limited to Macintosh? No, I, I think that there are issues that, that I'd like to learn more about from a staff perspective on at Dickens Park other parts of the Greenway, um, uh, at a union. I think, I think, I mean, certainly we've heard a lot about Macintosh and, and knowing what we're doing and what the options are um, and, and idea generation. But I, I, if it, I think we have issues beyond Macintosh and it would be helpful to get a broader perspective on kind of what they are and levels of intensity and because they may, they, there may be different solutions or options that we ought to consider in, in each venue. Thank you, Councilman uh, Waters, and that is why, and I probably didn't say it correctly, but I said our natural resource, our other natural resources, and I didn't name them specifically, but I agree with you. All right, and what the big question I was actually going to talk to Harold with this week was, 
it didn't seem to be a problem when Union was open. And so if, we've all, if we're now consolidating everything at Macintosh, uh, I just want, anyway, it, it, let's go ahead and vote and we can talk about it and have staff come back and we can do it then. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the ayes have it, carries unanimously. All right, thank you. Anything else from council? Mayor, I have just the reminder that uh, we have sent out that substitute uh, letter of agreement for item 8F on okay. consent agenda tonight. All right, then we will get, we'll hit that 8F. Um, let's go ahead and move on to city manager's report on COVID-19. How are we doing, Harold? Actually, Mary, we've got um, two items we've added to that are going to be regular uh, city manager reports. It's going to be um, COVID-19 and the uh, housing authority as we move forward. Um, Jeff Zayak is um, on the line and he's going to talk about some numbers, a couple of issues that you already brought up um, that we were, um, I was contemplating how we move forward and bring those to you all. Um, when we talk about the uh, the great outdoors, um, what I would say is that was actually a topic of conversation today and um, my administrators call with public health. The, um, we're, we're, we're not unique right now in the issues that we're facing in terms of the great outdoors and, and what's really happening. Um, and in some ways, um, in certain cases, it's not as bad as it is in other areas um, because of the trailheads right now um, in the foothills and in the mountains are creating a significant issue for the county as they look forward, as, they, as they're trying to deal with it and the number of people they just have congregating in those spots. That's actually going to touch on some of the masking conversations that are coming out and some of the requirements that will be brought forward, or not requirements, but um, public information that will be brought forward. In addition to the many of the points you made <clears throat> when we talk about the issues that our public works department and parks and natural resources are having, um, they're not limited um, to um, actually uh, Macintosh, where we're seeing similar issues at Union, similar issues at Dickens. Um, we had a huge issue occur at Button Rock um, uh, and uh, just the number of people that we were having up there um, and where they were parking. And um, I think we've gotten a handle of those issues uh, based on where we were early in this um, to the point where we've assigned a, a police officer at, um, especially on the weekends to both Button Rock and Union. And then we have a roving police officer that's working at McIntosh and Dickens. Um, you all know that we obviously had to close the bridge because folks were jumping off of the bridge um, and we knew that the water level was going down just to give you a sense of the types of issues that we're chasing, even after we gated it and closed it, we still had issues with people walking around um, and climbing the bridge and still trying to jump off. Um, so what I can tell you is generally we're, we're chasing these issues all over the community right now. Um, and then obviously, um, you know, that's in addition to the normal items that we're, we're working on. So I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity for us to bring that back. We're probably going to bring it back at the next study session. I know David and his group uh, have been compiling that and, and working on these issues. Um, uh, you know, as Councilmember Martin uh, mentioned earlier, the buoys are out on McIntosh as we were um, trying to get there. So uh, they're just trying to tackle these issues one at a time and, and really deal with them to the best of their ability. So that's when we'll bring it back. Um, at this point, it was a day of change um, in terms of some of the items that were released and the, the governor was talking today about um, protect our neighbors and what that's going to look like. Jeff will um, obviously touch on that. His presentation, I think probably one of the most significant changes today is that uh, the governor announced in his press conference uh, that within 48 hours, he is going to close bars and um, nightclubs. Um, and I think what you're seeing is that's something that is, is happening in many states right now based on the increased um, case, the, the cases that, that they're seeing in various states. Um, I know um, as a point of reference, when I was talking to my mom earlier, she was saying that they made the same decision in Texas a couple of days ago. You may have seen many of the, uh, that state was being profiled about the number of cases 
that were specifically related to one, a couple of facilities in Houston and Dallas. So you're just seeing states really move from this to give you also a sense of what we're doing internally. I have um, not allowed um, work-related travel um, because of many issues. And I've actually have extended that out um, and I haven't created a date certain on it just because we're not sure what people are going to get into and what states are going to do. Specifically, we heard that state um, locations in the Northeast were saying, if you come from an area that has a, a growing caseload, um, you're gonna have to potentially quarantine yourself for 14 days. It's actually not a new thing. Um, Hawaii has been doing that from the beginning. Um, it's the first time that it's really been something on the mainland US. And so we're just gonna continue that in terms of work-related travel based on, we don't want people to get stuck. We don't want people to go somewhere and then find out they have to quarantine. So we're managing all of those issues internally as well. Um, and we're trying to um, work with uh, Jeff and his staff in the county as we all try to understand what protect our neighbor means and when we can get in there. And I'll cover some points um, after Jeff's presentation. Uh, but generally today was another day of change and we don't understand it all, and we're gonna to work to try to understand it in the next couple of days. Jeff, are you ready? Susan, can you run Jeff's presentation or do you need me to? Jeff, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. You can pull up that first slide. Uh, thank you, Harold. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, council members. Appreciate being invited back. What I'm gonna do is run through the latest data updates that we have. It'll be similar to what you saw last time. And then on the end of this, what I did was I added a protect our neighbor update. So uh, I wasn't able to see the press conference today with the governor. So I didn't hear the details, but I did see what was sent out in writing. So I'm gonna cover those pieces with you, let you know what, uh, what I'm seeing and when we might be able to move to that next stage. <clears throat> this first graph is just again, our total case count. So we're at 1,392 in Boulder County. We have not seen much change in uh, the number of people that deceased. And again, the majority of the people that we've seen deceased in Boulder County um, have uh, come from long-term care facilities. I will talk uh, on a slide in, in, in the, as we're coming up, the work that we've done to really uh, put some supports into those long-term care facilities, which has really decreased uh, the numbers. So the next slide. One moment, there you go. There you go. This is this is the number of deaths in Boulder County. The orange represents long-term care facilities. Um, the blue represents others that are not in long-term care facilities. Um, and as you've seen uh, that I've presented before, that is consistent with what we're seeing in terms of data across the country. Definitely the largest percentage of the impacts are associated with our oldest percent of the population. Um, and it's also critical why we need, as we move forward, we need to make sure we're doing everything we can to maintain support um, for that critical population. If you looked at our hospitalizations, you would see that the majority of people hospitalized are going to be people above 50 years old, but the, the graph really jumps up when you start to get above 70 years old. So um, those are our, that's our population that's most, most at risk and the population that we definitely need to pay attention to. Next slide. Uh, this is the total uh, number of positives that we've seen in the county in, in terms of our testing. And again, um, what you'll see here is that early on in this process, that orange represents long-term care facilities. We had significant outbreaks uh, that started right after we got into COVID. And it was when they're in those facilities, really difficult to control, as I've said before, um, but with a lot of work, uh, both from our staff, as well as from uh, the directors and the staff in each of those facilities, we've really been able to, to get the spread of the disease under control and those facilities are doing really pretty well. Next slide. This is our uh, five day average of number of new cases. And what you can clearly see here is that spike, which is associated with what I'm guessing you've all heard about. And that was the outbreak that was associated primarily with uh, parties that were up on the hill um, during the week, the last week of May and into the first and second week of June. Um, we do have that outbreak 
um, under control, as you can see, our cases are continuing to decline. Um, we don't have, we are not seeing any other outbreaks in the county that we are not able to effectively control quickly. So the majority of the challenge here, and this was a pretty major challenge for us, um, just to give you an example, and those of you who are, who, are, who are tuned into this, for every positive case, it generates roughly five contacts um, of people who were associated with that case. That's the average. Um, for every positive case investigation, it's two hours. Uh, for each of those five contacts that we have to investigate, it can range anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours, depending on uh, the, the complexity of it. So that generates a lot of work in a very short time, and it's why it's so important as we move forward with, uh, with uh, Protect Our Neighbor that we have the ability to control the spread of that disease. So again, that's, that's the majority of what you're seeing in that spike right there. Um, Boulder County, uh, as I had reported in the previous weeks, has been doing really well. Really appreciate everybody that's been really working hard and sacrificing to keep our numbers low. And this is an example of what can happen if we don't pay diligent attention to that. Next slide. This is a really busy graph, um, but what I want you to pay attention to here is that um, the, one, the, the, the bar in red is Boulder County. So you can see that we popped up when we had the outbreaks, we're now on a decline. These other, uh, these other lines that you're seeing are the Metro Denver area. Uh, and the point here is that you can see that there is increasing cases across the Metro Denver area. None were as significant as ours. Our graph, um, our peak was higher than the peak at any point during COVID with this outbreak uh, associated with the Hill. Um, but there is increasing cases across the Metro area. We are seeing in general, those numbers between the 20 and 40 year olds primarily with a concentration more so in the 20 to 29 year olds. Um, so we do, that is part of what we're seeing across the nation as well. It's part of what you, what Harold just talked about <clears throat> and what uh, we know we need to focus on as we move forward. Next slide. This is our total testing. Um, and what's important to note here, one of, the, one of the protect our neighbor requirements is that we have the ability to test up to four, almost 500 cases per day. We, we easily have the ability to do that in Boulder County. So that is not a challenge. Um, we have tested, and I'm gonna show you on the next graph in just a second, um, that what we need to do is be able to test number one, all symptomatic cases in Boulder County. We can do that across the board right now. We have multiple testing sites. Those are available uh, on our website. And we've expanded our testing to the contacts of those people who are symptomatic so that we can more effectively control the spread of that disease. So if you go to the next slide, uh, without getting too technical here, the bottom line is you wanna maintain less than a 5% positivity rate. Um, and that is what this graph demonstrates. We are between, uh, between two and 4%. Um, and that's, that's good. That means we are testing enough of our population that we are identifying the positives that are out there. When you start to see positivity rates up in the 20s, you, you are in an active outbreak where you're not in control of that situation. And that's part of what we're seeing across the country right now. But in terms of testing, we're in good shape. Um, we do have ability to test and get outside of just symptomatic to now test uh, contacts of people who are positive. Next slide. This is the rate um, of residents who have tested pop positive per 100,000 population. Even though Longmont shows up as the highest here, the majority of the new cases uh, are coming from Boulder. And again, that is associated uh, primarily with the outbreak that we've seen there. Next slide. This is the hospitalization data that you've seen me show you before. Um, what you're gonna see as I go through these next couple slides is just that again, our hospitalization data is good for Boulder County. Uh, even though we've had a few more people show up in the hospital um, that have been COVID positive, our hospitalization rates are still very low uh, and continuing to stay very low. And this just shows what our rate looks like compared to the rest of the metro area. And again, Boulder County is that red line uh, on the bottom. Next slide. 
this is the total number of patients hospitalized in Boulder County um, due to COVID-19 and just demonstrates again what I had just said, which is our hospitalization rates uh, are low and are staying low. And that's what we wanna see as we move forward. Next slide. Uh, this is what we're facing that I'm sure everybody's probably been hearing about and listening to on the news. So this is the United States. Um, we are now at roughly a little over 40,000 cases per day. That is higher uh, than any time during this uh, pandemic uh, from the beginning. So we are headed in the wrong direction. We do want to be very thoughtful and careful about how things move forward. Uh, and because we don't want to be in some of the places in some of these graphs that I'm going to show you uh, from others across the nation that, again, I know we've all been hearing about. So uh, at, at a nationwide level and Colorado level, we have reason to take pause and make sure that we're being really careful um, and thoughtful about how we move forward. If you can go to the next slide. So I'm not going to go through all these, but I just want to point out a few that are uh, that are pretty challenging. Uh, Florida, Texas, Arizona. The steepness of those curves, as you can see, creates massive challenges. Uh, if you look at that graph, again, in the, in the entire previous time in the outbreak, those states are far above the numbers that they saw any time previous during the outbreak. And those are pretty challenging situations. Colorado is down there um, on the, in the middle and it's, it's pretty, we're pretty low in Colorado um, because, because we, we've done a good job and we wanna to continue to do a good job. You can see that we do have a tail up, just like I showed you with those Metro cases. Um, we do have some increasing cases and I think the governor is being prudent um, about making sure that as we move to protect our neighbor that you have to meet certain metrics um, that I'll talk about now uh, to, to really make sure that we're not just jumping ahead without being really thoughtful. I think the governor's watching the cases that are occurring around in other states. Uh, he's, he's meeting with his staff at CDPHE. They're doing a lot of analysis and they're doing a lot of watching and they're being cautious. So if you can go to the next slide. So in order to go, and again, my caveat here is I did not hear the press conference today. Um, but I'm, I, I took the materials that I saw distributed today and pulled from those materials. We will have more information uh, by next week as we move further into this. Um, but to enter Protect Our Neighbors, and really the biggest difference between Protect Our Neighbor, neighbor at this point um, and where we are right now is that you can open up all areas at 50% um, of pre-pandemic levels. And the, the only caveat to that is that you cannot go, uh, you cannot do that in areas where there's more restrictive orders. So as, as Harold just mentioned, the governor is announcing or has announced uh, that they're going to be closing closing bars and nightclubs. Uh, so that would be an example where you obviously that doesn't apply to that 50%. Um, but this really opens up all areas to 50% capacity, and that still maintains um, some of the social distancing requirements that. The modeling is showing that we need to do in order to be able to move into the fall without surging our hospitals to a place that others are facing right now. So again, I think it's a very thoughtful approach. Um, I appreciate uh, how the state has approached this and really been uh, careful about looking at metrics. So for each of the things that you see on here, low disease transmission levels, local public health agency capacity for testing and hospital ability to meet the needs of all patients, there is specific metrics that we need to meet in order to be able to, um, they're calling it certification. So we have to do an application process where we demonstrate how we meet these different metrics. And then if we meet those metrics, then we are certified to move into a protect our neighbor uh, uh, framework. And if we don't, then we stay at safer at home. And obviously the governor is still maintaining three different levels, stay at home. So if we have to move backwards, um, which none of us want to do. We all know that. Um, uh, we have safer at home and we have now protect our neighbors. So those three categories will still remain. Um, and then there will be counties that are at different levels depending on whether they can meet the metrics in these areas or not. Next slide. Um, these are, this is additional requirements. Um, each county that applies has to have a mitigation and containment plan that describes what's, what they're gonna do if they start to fall out of the compliance 
with the metrics that we had to meet in order to get into compliance. That includes things like, um, just as an example, really a lot of this is based on that case uh, containment. So we can lean on, we have mutual aid agreements that allow us to lean on our neighbors, on the state. The state has brought in, a, uh, as I'm sure you've all heard, a fair amount of AmeriCorps folks who can uh, do contact tracing. So again, I think our state has taken a, a really proactive and careful approach to moving this forward. Um, and that is part of what we would need to do in order to move to this next level and to make sure that we're staying within that next level. These, uh, these components that you see here about how it must be approved are new components, which I think, again, are thoughtful. Uh, this needs to be approved by all local, local electeds, uh, county commissioners, mayors, uh, hospitals that serve in our county, law enforcement and emergency management across the county, um, and the local public health director. And in addition to that, the plan has to demonstrate how counties will promote public compliance with the guidelines. And I, I just wanna give a plug um, to all of you folks in Longmont and how much work um, and partnership you've demonstrated and helping us meet that specifically. Harold and his staff have been wonderful. They've been at the table with us, really working through challenges when we're running into them. Police department's been completely supportive. Um, and as has uh, your staff with educational approach as well. So your, your commitment to this is gonna help us make sure that we can move forward based on that. Um, and then how counties will increase mask wearing. Uh, we did extend our mask order um, indefinitely. Be, and when I say indefinitely, we will continue to obviously look at the mask evidence. The mask evidence is getting stronger um, and there's more demonstration that masks are reducing the spread of disease. And that is going to be, as, as you see here, one of the requirements is we have to demonstrate that we can continue to do that. We will be also doing a monthly monitoring. We have um, set up a monitoring program. Uh, in addition to the, the surveys that we're doing with our businesses to ask some of these questions, we're doing on the ground monitoring across uh, jurisdictions uh, on a monthly basis that includes uh, looking for our, the, our, our businesses as an example, following social distancing requirements, and are they following masking requirements? We're looking in different cities as well as the county, and we'll continue to, to use that um, to help guide education efforts. So when we run into hotspots, we already have a team that's in place that, that includes some of your staff from code, code enforcement, as an example, that are meeting and talking about where are these hotspots showing up and how do we make sure we're dedicating more education and support to making sure that we are actually following it. Our mask assessments have been very positive. We haven't done one in the last three weeks. We will be doing one next week. Um, but the last one that we did was uh, demonstrating that we have a very high compliance rate um, with mask wearing, which has been great. And then the last thing is how will, uh, we have to demonstrate how we'll, incre incre how we'll increase influenza vaccine uptake. And of all the years, of how important that is, this one is critical. If you think about the symptoms and the requirements for having people stay home when they have any kind of symptoms that look a lot like vaccine, I'm sorry, a lot like COVID and influenza together, those have similar type symptoms. So having people get influenza vaccine this fall is gonna be critically important. And the state has made um, some money available to local public health agencies to support more education and outreach around that. So I, I believe we'll be able to meet all of those things based on things that we have in place right now. Um, but just note that it will need to come to local electeds uh, to, to submit the, the application. And that's all I have at this point. I don't have any other things. I guess the only other thing I would wanna emphasize uh, to everyone that's listening in here is our ability to, to really control the spread of this disease. We, don't, we, we all know we don't have enough people to assure there's enforcement everywhere. We don't have enough people to do ed education in every single place um, where people are out in our communities. It really does come down to each one of our individual responsibilities to do everything we can to maintain social distancing of six feet from each other. Um, that will help us stop the spread of the disease. Where it's difficult to do that, wear a mask, a mask is making a difference. Um, and if we can continue to do that, we can continue to keep our numbers down. I think part of the challenge uh, that you're probably also seeing 
uh, at the national level is there are states now that are putting travel restrictions in place because even if Colorado is doing pretty well, we know that we have a lot of people traveling in and out of states and those people can spread that disease. That, if you remember the graphs early on that I showed you, there was a lot of associated spread with travel. We don't want that scenario to happen again. So, um, so that is just, those are all things to pay attention to as we continue to, to look forward. I wanna thank you all. Thank you, Councilmember Christensen. You're muted, Polly. I thought I did. Um, <laughs> Jeff, thank you for your leadership on this and, and uh, thank you for your kind words about our staff. I, our, our staff and the police department work really, really hard and they're <laughs> under huge amount of stress right now. Um, so one thing I am wondering, I realize that Weld County is not considered, I guess, part of the greater Denver, Denver metro area, but not to be snotty about it, I'd like to see the statistics on Weld County because I think it would make us look good. I just think that would be interesting to look at. Um, the second thing is, as you mentioned, I um, there are states that are putting restrictions or on people who travel out of the state. Um, there are a whole lot of people I know who are angry at um, city council for not having fireworks this uh, year, which we could have had if they would just follow the guidelines. But um, so they're planning to go up to Wash to Wyoming, which is of course having spikes in in their records. So I'm a little worried about people going up to Wyoming and getting sick and coming back down here. Do you have any um, guidelines or suggestions for how to handle that? Well, I don't, I don't know that we can prohibit people from doing that, but what I'm gonna say to you is the same thing I said before. It, people are putting our economy, our, our society at risk. If they go into places where there's lots of people in crowds and you can't maintain social distancing, Again, we can't control every single one of those situations. And unless people take personal responsibility um, to avoid those situations, we, we will see this disease spread. I know, thank you. I, I wish people really understood that the only way we can open up again and get back to normal is if people do follow social distancing and hygiene and general courtesy. Okay, so if I can, <laughs> if, if I can jump in real quick while Jeff's still here too, um, Susan, I'm going to share my screen. Um, one of the things, and, and this was just updated after Jeff sent his PowerPoint on their website, so you'll see the correlation. And if you all can see this, um, as Jeff talked about, at least how the state's issuing the rules, we we know we know what the the you know I call it we know what the the game is that we're playing now. And, and what we're playing is don't have increased cases, have the capacity to trace, have the capacity to test. And to give you a sense of the impact on this, um, how people act and, and how they approach things really impacts our local businesses and the people that work in those local businesses because Jeff and his staff are actually working to get ready to look at a variance that would have allowed us to operate a little bit differently or in a different way uh, and be a, more open because of the way our numbers were looking. Uh, before they could submit the variants, we saw the increase of in cases in Boulder. And so that did not allow us to open up more businesses. And so at the end of the day, you know, that really hurt our local businesses and the people that have to work there or the people that work there in order to, you know, to expand what they're able to do. And when you look at this chart, this is really important to me, and Jeff, if I'm missing any of these, you, you help me on this one. If you remember, we were at 500 a couple of weeks ago, and we sort of held at 517, and we were almost double the cases of Boulder. Boulder is now um, 12 cases from, from Longmont. And what's interesting is, is when you look at the population, they lost 
probably 20,000 students. So we're probably the largest city now in terms of population, but they've caught up to us in cases. And then if you come up here and you look at this chart, and this is exactly what Jeff was talking about, the largest growth in cases occurred in this 20 to 29 demographic. Um, and that was what was associated with what they saw on the Hill and, and those parties. And, and to your question is, those increases really penalize our local businesses um, in terms of how they're going to be able to operate and how we move forward, because that is what the state is saying we, that Jeff and we all have to look like in terms of whether or not we can move into um, the protect our number phase or protect our number, protect our neighbors uh, phase. The numbers are gonna be how those decisions are going to be made based on what the governor's communicated. And so now, um, if, they, if the variance was in play, it's really protect our neighbors. You have to go 14 days out from this in order to just consider it. So it's really delayed what we're able to do to support, you know, our community. Did I get that right, Jeff? You were perfect. All right, uh, Council Member Ridalgo Ferring. Okay, so I had a couple of questions around the mask. You had mentioned something about a mask assessment. What does that entail? What is that? You, we, you said there was one three weeks ago. You're, we're coming up to another. Um, you know, I just wanted to know what that, what that yeah, looks like. Yeah, it, it entails, um, as there's two components to it. One is asking the businesses what they are seeing. We have a series of, I think it's about 20 or so questions. Happy to share this with all of you. Um, and we're asking business what they're seeing relative to social distancing and masking. We ask other questions besides that. Uh, in a, and we are also doing on the ground assessments. So we are going into stores of different sizes and I may not have all these details exactly correct, but we're going into stores of different sizes, small, medium, large, and we're doing on the ground assessments and we're watching um, in the stores, are people maintaining social distancing at six feet or greater? Um, and then what percentage of people are or are not? And then in those same stores, we're also looking at are people wearing masks or not. Uh, and so that's the type of assessment that we're looking at. And we're doing that in different geographic areas, um, including mountain versus plains um, and municipalities. Okay. And the target is really 80%. If we see about 80% of the public utilizing masks, we're okay. I don't know if I, I well, can tell you that because I haven't, I haven't modeled that specifically. Um, so I don't know that I can speak to what would happen if 80% were versus 60% as an example. Okay. What I can tell you that is that in any scenario where you can't maintain six feet social distancing and it's six feet social distancing, just so you all know what CDC's guidance is, it's six feet social distancing. If you're less than six feet for more than 15 minutes, then you're at increased risk for spread of the virus. So wherever there is less than six feet, if you're not wearing a mask, you have that much more ability to potentially get the virus. We know that masks will reduce the spread of large droplets. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some more articles that are coming out that looked at states that had mandatory masking versus non-mandatory masking and what that looked like in terms of uh, total amount of virus spread in those states. So, um, so the, the bottom line is, Whenever, whenever you're gonna be even challenged about being within six feet, you should wear a mask. Um, and, and masking is not the panacea, um, but it's an important tool. Maintaining six foot distancing is the number one thing. Obviously hand washing, making sure that you're thinking about when you put your mask on and off, you're not contaminating yourself. Those are all important pieces um, that taken together can make a big difference and have made a big difference. And are you finding that when we, you look at what information you're, um, the World Health Organization is sending out, CD, CDC, um, other states, are you finding that it's coming more in line or is it still, because I know early on there were just different messages all over the place. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, de yeah, definitely there's been different messages all over the place without a doubt. And what I would say is that the Centers for Disease Control has been for, it's probably over a month now, been recommending 
mass to the general public. Um, the, I haven't looked at the World Health Organization lately, but there was a time when the World Health Organization was saying, you only need masks for people who are sick, but we know that masks make a difference now. The, the, um, as an example, the Surgeon General is speaking really clearly about masking and the needing for masks in general public because we know that it reduces the spread of large droplets and can be effective at reducing the spread of the disease, um, especially in some of the states that weren't necessarily pushing that mask um, message, you're now seeing a lot more mask messaging being pushed um, because people know that it can help uh, assure that we're doing everything we can to keep our economies open and our ability to be able to move and not be in a lockdown type situation or stay at home type situation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, Harold, what else do we need? Oh, sorry, Dr. Waters didn't see the hand. Oh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, Jeff, just building on, on the conversation you were just having, um, uh, we continue, and you, you wouldn't be surprised, I'm certain you do as well, uh, get a fair amount of incoming messages about how dare you uh, require, even though we're not requiring, right? I mean, there are explanations that come from the county about masks and under what conditions. Um, but all right, do you have any advice on, on what the specific messaging is? I mean, this is, since it's voluntary for the most part, because enforcement is so difficult, it, are, there, are, there, are there any messages that are more persuasive than others? Uh, is it, uh, I suspect shaming is not the right you know, approach, but it's hard not to. I mean, how do, what, what, what have you learned, if anything, about here are the two or three key points or messages that are more likely to cause people who have chosen to turn, make this a political statement to turn it into an understanding of what we, that we are responsible for one another, or it's about the common good, or it's just about the economy and trying to you know, keep our economy moving. Well, I can uh, say a couple of things. So there is, there is some people, and we do, we do get that same feedback as well. There, and there is some folks who, um, for whatever reasons they have, just don't believe that masks are a, an effective tool. And, um, and even when we provide messages and we show information, it still is not very convincing. So, and I, I completely understand that that's the world we live in and we know that. What I try to make sure that we're emphasizing to people is that this, this doesn't help me specifically. It doesn't help you specifically that we're protecting each other because we wanna protect our community and our economy. Um, none of us wanna go back to a place where we're having to shut things down. That's not good for anybody and we all know it. Um, and that's the message that we keep trying to get to people. I can tell you that our chamber is 100% behind, both our chambers are 100% behind this. We've been working with the chambers um, who have been emphasizing the same thing. The importance of social distancing and masking helps all of us. Um, and when we don't take responsibility for that, we can see outbreaks that occur that then put all of us at risk. Not just, not just us individually or our, our, our parents or our grandparents, but, but again, our society and our economy. So I think it's really important uh, that we continue to emphasize those things. And, and, the, and it's up to people's individual behaviors. They're the ones who are gonna make the difference. And again, I, I just wanna say thank you to so many of the people who have really worked so hard and sacrificed because our numbers outside of that outbreak were very positive and have remained completely positive, especially comparative to the metro area. Um, so we can do it together. And this is not forever. We're gonna have a vaccine at some point that's gonna be available, um, but we do need to be diligent in the interim. Mayor Bagley, can I follow up one, with one more question to Harold? You can. Um, uh, Harold, what, when we get questions, cause we do, I just got an email, you know, just before the council meeting um, expressing concerns about enforcement. Um, where are we with enforcement? Are we still in an education phase? Will we always be in an education phase? Is there a point with individuals where it's no longer education, but people do get cited? Have anybody been, have, have any people been cited? Are there places that we are paying, to which we're paying more attention with, with more vigorous enforcement than other places? Just give us the gestalt and what, what we should know and how we could help the community understand what can what can we do and what can't we do with respect to enforcement? Yeah, so I think generally um, what I would say, and you, Jeff's talked about this, and this was also the topic of conversation, 
um, if you talk to any of the administrators, what you will see is we just don't have enough bodies to be everywhere to enforce everywhere. Um, but what we do try to do is, is really target that. So you heard me say on the weekends when we do see certain upticks, we are devoting officers to assist our parks and recreation staff. And you know, a big shout out to those folks because um, we're asking them to come in for overtime to help us on these items. And so we are uh, specifically placing uh, folks around McIntosh, Union, um, Dickens, um, and Button Rock, as I said earlier. We are still trying to really um, approach it from a, uh, an education standpoint, because we're also finding that actually we get more compliance with that, uh, that approach than you know, just issuing tickets, because all you do is really then create a situation where people can become more um, in, entrenched in their position um, and, and try to talk to them about, well, here's who you're really impacting. Um, and, and so I, what we've always said in this is, is, and our officers have this discretion at all times, it, it also is gonna depend on the situation, how many people we're seeing, um, how they're approaching it. You know, it's one thing if it's, you know, five people, it's another thing if it's a hundred, if it's a hundred, we're probably calling, we're calling Jeff and it's not just us, it would be us and the County Health Department and others all engaging in that particular issue. So the answer is um, we still really try to, to take the education approach. Um, we are targeting people based on where we're seeing significant pushes um, and where we don't have enough people to, to respond. But we also can't do that all the time because in the middle of all of this, what we're also dealing with is our normal daily activities um, and the staff loads that that presents. And that really ties into what you all were talking about in terms of the challenges that we're facing with our parks folks. So I didn't probably give you the numbers um, and I can get those numbers and see what we're really dealing with. What I can tell you is that the reports that I get in terms of the number of calls we're at least getting into the system, those have gone down for Longmont um, and we've been pretty stable in, in terms of the, the issues that we're having to deal with. We're not seeing it as we were other than um, what we're seeing at McIntosh and the calls that we're all getting on that. One of the other challenges in this is how, do, you know, when they define it, a family group, and how do you verify who's part of the family? There's a lot of nuances in this that don't make it as simple as, as, as we would all like it to be. All right, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I just wanna say, because there are probably more people watching at this point in the, council meeting then later during the comments is that um, for those of you who think Longmont doesn't have the right that we shouldn't be enforcing or telling people to wear masks, I want you just to look at the country. Um, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey now have banned travel from Florida. They, no Floridians are allowed to go into that tri-state area because their numbers are so high they did not comply. Their mayors and governors did not take this seriously. Um, also with Arizona and Texas, their mayors and governors didn't take it seriously at all. We now have Europe banning travel from the United States because they do not want, the, they don't feel that the United States is taking this seriously enough and they don't want their numbers to escalate again this, if you're only concerned about the economics of this, look at the economics of us not being able to go to Europe on business, to conduct business as usual. So we all have to take personal responsibility. None of us want to be police. So I am asking you, please comply with the mask and the social distancing. We don't want to go back to safe at home or even more stringent measures. So um, I'm asking everybody in this community to please comply. Thank you. All right, Harold, anything else? Um, I was gonna do a BioBot update, but um, we've kind of gone long on this one. So Robert, um, Annie and your group, if you're here, we'll bring it back the next time. Sorry about that. Right, thanks Harold. All um, right. I go do ahead. have LHA now. Yep, go ahead. Um, so as you all know, um, you, you passed the resolutions and we talked about um, the, that I have been 
um, now on the board, appointed the executive board member, and we've got our team in place. I just wanted to give you a sense on who we've brought in to work with this. Uh, so generally, um, you have uh, three of us, Kathy, Karen, and myself, that are working on, on, on pretty high level to mid-level issues generally with the, the housing authority. Um, um, typically, what I've taken on in that is really working on the information technology and maintenance side directly. Um, um, Kathy is really working finance construction. Karen is, is taking the organizational and residential culture and operations. Obviously, all of those at different times, I'm getting briefed on it by everyone in terms of the work that we're doing. Jim Golden is coming in and out and advising on our finance components. Jim's going to be more involved with this. Um, but in addition to that, we've um, taken Tracy DeFrancesco, who works in our community development department, um, has experience with housing authorities. Um, she's spending uh, a fair amount of time there operationally within, in the building, uh, working with them to, to really work through um, leasing issues and understand what's going on so that we can have as much data as we possibly can get as, we move, as we're moving forward. Kendra Daniels, who came in with our disaster recovery um, and really did a lot of the counting with the feds there, has also, we had some capacity with her. We've asked her to jump in and she's working with count, uh, Kathy on the accounting and financials. Um, Kathy Woods, um, who is our, um, over our ETS department is the project lead that I'm working with on the technology issues and those are significant. Jeff Cedars working with the facility maintenance group um, as we do this. And then we put together a team of Michelle Wade, Carmen Ramirez, Ellie Berto, and Karen. Um, and I'm probably missing other folks um, really on the residential organizational issues. And then our public information team with uh, Steph Bergman and Marika are really jumping in to help us get that information out. Um, at the moment, we're still really in triage mode in terms of the items that we're dealing with. Um, the first one that, that we're having to tackle and we're gonna have to deal with it quickly um, is really in the realm of technology. Um, you know, what I, the analogy that I'm using with everyone else is if you're a carpenter, you, know, you really kind of need a hammer and a saw to do your work. Um, in many cases, they don't have a hammer and a saw um, to do their work. And, and an example of that is the majority of their computers are older. Um, and they can't even handle the current software requirements. Um, one of their financial and, um, financial analysts, um, her computer won't even allow her to open two spreadsheets at once without crashing. It's approximately 10 years old. And so um, we're having to really dig in on just the core infrastructure in that piece. Um, you know, we know for two years at least, they've been on a month-to-month -month contract with their um, computer pro, uh, provider and so we're working to understand what that looks like and how we can bring that in and really gain an economy of scale with our system. Um, that then ties into the camera systems that we have at facilities and then their security systems um, and trying to integrate that um, so we can operate more efficiently and effective. Um, instead of having multiple internet providers, we want to be able to take it to one um, and multiple phone carriers. Uh, but the good news is, I think, where we were a couple of weeks ago and where we are today is we really now completely understand that issue and we're moving forward in terms of designing the plan that we need um, to, to really create a more efficient and effective operation. Uh, building maintenance, um, you know, it's interesting as we talk to them. Um, you know, we know there's not an ongoing maintenance plan. There's no ongoing capital replacement plan. Uh, but in terms of the maintenance supervisor, you know, what I would say is he just doesn't have time to deal with it um, based on the staffing levels. And so um, definitely have had some good conversations. That's where we're going to go in and help him and, and try to bring those things together. Based on the audits that we've seen and some uh, that have come in, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we're going to bring um, our city's personnel rules and purchasing policies and establish those and put those in place so that we can ensure that we're in compliance with federal and state requirements in addition to the audits that, that we've received. Um, and, and then at a, another foundational level is really bringing in training uh, for, the, for the folks that are in various positions. Um, 
because we've also seen that that's really been an, an operational issue where uh, folks weren't necessarily trained appropriately uh, to do their job. Um, and, and, you know, again, that's another um, issue that's, that's really foundation to, to the organization. So, you know, generally, Kathy made the comment to me earlier, she's like, are we going to give them good news? Um, I think in, in many ways, this is actually good news because in a, in a fairly short period of time, the team's been able to come in and really dig in and we can set courses that are, you know, directions we need to go in on all of these issues um, and can start moving on that. And then in the middle of this, kind of tacking on to what we talked about with the COVID where we still have our daily issues we need to deal with, we had the suites get hit by lightning last week. And, and so then you have a situation where you're trying to do this work now you have air conditions going out, microwaves going out, range is going out, uh, telephones. And so you're trying to very quickly circle around that and deal with it. Um, and I think that's where you really then start looking at capacity and capability. And so in about two to three days, um, yesterday, um, by, the, by the end of the day yesterday, um, everyone that was without an air condition, we actually had the portable air conditioning units in their facilities. Um, we got the adjuster to come out. And so we're really looking on that broader replacement piece. But those are really things that occur that we're all heading this way. And we all just had to kind of stop what we were doing and jump in and start dealing with this issue um, as, as, a, as a team. And, and it worked well. I mean, again, so that's a positive thing, seeing how you move through these challenges and how you can get through it. And uh, I was really happy with the way everyone came together um, to deal with that issue. Um, on another note, in terms of the main office, um, we're looking at a soft opening next week, um, an official opening the week after that. Um, the big thing that we're challenged with right now, and this is, a, again, where we're tapping into other resources with Michelle Waite, Dan Eamon, and then um, Eugene and, and Liz in the attorney's office, is really start understanding the rules regarding um, our, our multifamily facilities and specifically those facilities that are for older adults in terms of how we can open those. Um, because as you saw for the, from the presentation, they can be challenges related to the COVID world. And so we're, we haven't made a decision yet on those facilities uh, because we really want to understand the orders, understand the risk before we make a decision. Um, and like many decisions I've had to make recently, um, some people don't like it, yeah, but, but at the end of the day, um, you know, our responsibility is for the self health and safety of the individuals that live in those facilities. Um, and we're going to make a prudent decision on that. Um, so we'll know more um, in the in the very near future. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy really uh, on a quickly so she can she can give you the good news because Kathy actually has a lot of good news on things that we've been able to deal with um, that were, were challenged. They were opportunities. Um, and um, she was able to move through those with her team. Kathy? Hi, everyone. Um, so the best news that we have so far is as of about a couple hours ago, we are 100% leased and occupied at Fall River Apartments. So we um, met our goal of having that done by the end of June. Um, staff did just a fantastic job in moving through those units as soon as we were opened up and people could start going um, back in and um, looking at units. Um, so we can start our qualified occupancy um, July 1. And then in about three months, um, that shows our stability, financial stability at the property, and we can convert everything to a permanent um, loan structure. So that's, that's really excellent news. And Kathy, one of the things in terms of the relationship, I know in terms of finding the people that we could move in there, there were conversations in what you all were seeing on the housing side that we have internally and really connecting with the housing authority, which is something we've been wanting for a while and, and we were actually able to implement it, which helped I think with that, is that correct? Right, yeah. As they moved through the wait list pre-COVID, um, things were going really well. And then when COVID hit um, and they went back to the wait list, folks were not, some folks weren't interested. So we reached out to our senior services staff and. Carmen and her group and some of our other um, partners 
and put the word out that units were available and and that really helped to move those along and helped us move through much quicker than than what um, we probably could have um, otherwise. Um, on the other properties, um, <clears throat> we have been working diligently on getting um, vacant units on the market and rented. Um, as of the middle of this month, we had 23 vacancies. I think this is what we reported to the LHA board at their June 16th meeting. Um, we had 23 vacancies for a 22,500 um, rent loss. And as of today, we're um, down to 13 vacancies for a $14,500 um, rent loss. So those are moving through pretty quickly um, and we're starting to get a rhythm for turning those units. Um, <clears throat> we are reviewing leases at all the properties to um, move to a more uniform lease that meets all um, federal and state requirements. Um, we've been reviewing rents, uh, the rent structures to ensure that they're compliant with all the different funding sources and that we are um, um, moving rents up where we can and where we need to um, and um, just making sure that we're following all the, all the requirements. We've been also reviewing property budgets to um, uh, pr uh, reviewing the, the budgets against the current status um, and resources to expenses um, to ensure that we're capturing um, all of those and how that all rolls up into the Longmont Housing Authority's overall budget, making sure that um, admin fees and different management fees get um, processed and moved up and that we're capturing everything that's owed um, to that. Um, so there's been a lot of work, especially Tracy's been working a lot on um, ensuring compliance with the rent structures and the resources um, on every property. And we're slowly making our way through that. Um, <clears throat> on the Aspen Meadows Apartments um, refinance and rehab, that is back on track. I think we reported um, maybe last time that um, we had lost our investor. Um, they pulled out um, in the middle of the COVID and we were able to find, get down Manny, sorry, <laughs> dog. <laughs> um, we were able to find another investor. Um, we've been working on all the paperwork that they require that we're going through everything again with a new investor on new forms. Um, we're confirming pricing and construction schedule with the contractor that we have on board. Um, we have had to change because now we're not gonna close um, and start the, the rehab until probably mid to late October. So we're moving um, the whole schedule from starting on the exterior. If we could have started in July, we would have done a lot of the exterior work and then moved to the interior. We're gonna have to flip that. So we have to reschedule everything and figure that out and the impacts on the residents. Um, and we're working on a relocation plan for those residents because some of them won't be able to stay in place when the elevator gets replaced um, or when the windows are going in or when their units are being uh, worked on. So I'm um, trying to figure all that out. We have been working with our city purchasing um, staff to get us quotes for motels, costs of motels if we have to move people in, um, moving um, pods um, to have on site. And also, um, I guess that's the three things that we've been working with them on. Um, and Molly O'Donnell from my staff is taking on the um, construction oversight. So there'll be a contractor, they'll have a, a project manager, but she's gonna serve as the LHA's project manager to make sure and look out for the interests of the, the housing authority during all that and has already started work with the contractor and getting um, everything set up. We've also a uh, unique thing that I don't think they've ever done before is we are bringing in our maintenance staff to look at some of the specs things that are spec to see, does that make sense to them? Um, do they have something else that works better in the other properties that we can get some economies of scale by specking all of the same AC units in every building eventually get to a point like that. So then um, we've got some efficiencies and we can purchase ahead to a certain extent and be able to move um, forward on that a little bit more quickly. Um, and then Cameron from our facilities management um, staff is also um, helping to um, review some of those things. Um, and then finally, I wanted to report um, on the voluntary compliance agreement, our fair housing um, and um, ADA agreement that we had with HUD, the housing authority had with HUD. 
Um, it is a big agreement and there's a lot of work that has to be done around that. Um, we have um, submitted all of the required updated policies um, to HUD for their review. So they're all um, with HUD for them to review. They'll get comments back to us and we'll go back and forth probably a couple of times on getting those all up to date. And then we can disseminate those out and make sure everyone's following the same um, reasonable accommodation policies, grievance policies, um, all of the things that comply with fair housing. Um, and then we're going to need to start on a um, unit by unit, building by building inspection, um, putting out an RFP for um, a architect or a consultant to come and help us implement that by inspecting all of the, the buildings in the unit and then telling us what meets um, ADA code and what doesn't and how can we move forward with that. We will probably link that. Um, we saw some economies of scale. If we link it with um, and include in the RFP to also do a capital improvement plan and um, a maintenance plan for each building as well, um, get two birds with one stone kind of thing um, for the same, um, same pricing or the same under the same contract. Um, that will have to wait until um, COVID restrictions are lifted and we can go into units, but we're gonna get ready so that as soon as that happens, we're, we're ready to go. I have to say HUD has been really good at working with us and a couple of times we've had to ask for some extensions, especially on this piece because of COVID, we couldn't go in to inspect units. So um, that has been postponed until the end of this year. And they said, if we need another postponement, depending on what's happening, um, that we can do that as well. So as long as we're staying in touch with them, they have been really good um, in working with us. But that was a really important um, compliance piece that we have to make sure that we pay attention to and don't let fall through the cracks and that we meet the requirements we need to meet. I think that's all I have. Oh, I did wanna also say we did just um, enter into a contract with a consultant to go through and look at <clears throat> the LHA from uh, the perspective of a former um, uh, housing authority director. Um, so she's gonna look at financial, she's gonna look at job descriptions. Are people doing what they um, is in their job description? Do we need to look at um, restructuring? Um, and just really taking some uh, like an outside look at things and giving us some um, feedback on that, um, which we can then compare to what we're finding as well. So um, that should be done by the end of July, her report back to us, so. All right, the only question I have Harold is I actually asked um, for some information from the, from uh, our human resources director about additional uh, responsibilities that were being pushed on to you and Kathy and Karen and uh, reallocating um, budgets from LHA to you. Um, I know that you feel uncomfortable talking about that, but when can we expect to hear from her? Um, probably by the end of the week. Perfect. I will await that conversation, then I'll put it on the agenda when I hear from her. All right, great. Any other, thank you very much, Kathy. It sounds like you guys have a daunting task and we appreciate everything you're doing. Um, you're doing a great job and keep it up. So, we'll so I will to... say, Mayor, we've also been keeping track of, of some of the things like that in um, facilities work and the ETS work. So to have a new IGA um, with them or an amendment to the IGA, I think we said we were gonna start doing that, bringing back separate ones um, or smaller ones um, that are more specific to exactly um, what work we're doing. So we are tracking that and um, probably we'll have one, I would guess, Harold, in the next month. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to need another IGA. Um, we're going to need it. We're probably going to have to step into this incrementally similar to how we approached it with the flood where we had one and then we amend it because um, the first one we have to get in is on the ETS side so we can get that system stabilized. Um, and, and that's going to be the base for a lot of things that we have to do. Um, and integrate the Yardi system into to how we approach it. Are there any All questions? Right. We're good. It looks like we're good. Thanks, Harold. Um, it's 8.30. Um, shall we try to do public invited to be heard before we take a break? Let's look, is that okay? All right, let's go ahead and actually let, 
no, let's take a five minute break while we wait for people to get on public invited to be heard. And then by the time we start again, we'll cut off the list and that way we'll, we'll uh, know how many. So let's take a five minute break, but we'll now move on to public invited to be heard. So if you are listening to the broadcast at this time, go ahead and dial 669-900-6833 and then enter the meeting ID and get in line. Um, and then uh, we also ask that you get in line now for ordinances on second reading, which is uh, matter nine. And uh, we'll, we'll be back in five. Thank you, everybody. Mayor, we're ready for the public invited to be heard when council is ready. All right, let's go ahead and if you can hear my voice, let's get back on. There's four of us here. There's five. So Six. it looks like we have three callers. Okay. Um, and the slide has has stopped on the screen. So do you want me to go ahead and close public invited yep. to be heard? Let's all right. go ahead and close it. And I will admit all of them and call them each one at a time. Okay. Actually, it looks like we have more than that. We've got one, two, three, four, five guests that have called in. Cool. The first guest, your phone number ends in 376. I'm gonna unmute you. Would you please state your name and your address? And you have three minutes. Guest 376, do you hear me? Oh, oh I'm sorry. This is, a, yes, 2376. Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, Christine Dominic. I'm at Thank 1003 you. Sunset Street. Hi. Uh, so I am, so my background is I'm marketing, ironically, I'm marketing director of Centura Health, so I know a lot about what's going on with COVID uh, behind the scenes within the health system there. Uh, but also, I'm the wife of Hayden Peacock, who is the owner of the Chinese Medicine Clinic in uh, downtown Longmont. Um, so I wanted to express my concerns in regards to the um, parking and the closing off of uh, lanes on Main Street. And the two concerns that I have are his clients specifically. So he sees a good bit of individuals who are older. And if you know uh, about the circumstances with COVID, um, uh, sorry, um, that, you know, there's a lot of restrictions in terms of moving around. And I can talk about anecdotally with my own mother, uh, her being restricted from the activities that she normally would do uh, as an older retiree to the point where there's mental health implications of that. So um, by closing off the parking and Main Street uh, significantly is going to really um, make it challenging for his clients to be able to access uh, his clinic uh, because they are utilizing his services in a, as a, in a safe way to be able to get care and be able to interact with somebody that can provide that care, both you know, he's acupuncture, but also from a mental health perspective. Uh, the other concern that I have is just logistically 
with the closures, um, you know, the alleyscape is what I would think would be a fabulous idea. But also, like I said, logistically, you're closing it off. My concern is having outdoor diners not wearing masks and then having these other people moving about on the street, on the, on the paved area with masks. And you've spent a good bit of time talking about concerns with masks and unmasking. So if you actually have these uh, patrons in the alley, it would eliminate a lot of concern that maybe patrons who are just walking up and down the street with their masks um, would have with the patrons that are not. I mean, I know there's a lot of misinformation about what is or isn't okay in terms of mask wearing, uh, but you know, people are still going to think what they're going to think, and it may actually cause issues with um, individuals wanting to actually uh, come downtown. So, um, also, thirdly, I mean, I should say just the the traffic issues and what would happen pushing uh, all that traffic, uh, that highway traffic onto residential streets. So, I mean, that's a third point. So. Um, that those are my concerns. I'm going to keep it short. I know I'm only have three minutes, but right. those and are that, my concerns. And that was three. Thank you very much. Appreciate Great. it. Great. Thank All you right. very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Next. Caller, your phone number ends in 396. I've just unmuted you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, this is Scott Cook at the Longmont Chamber. Thank you. You can hear me? Okay. Y yes, we um, can. Yeah, so this is... Okay, great. Uh, Scott Cook from the Longmont Chamber, uh, 528 Main Street. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and City Council. Uh, the Chamber recently took a position to support the LDDA's request for lane closures on Main Street to expand public space in the downtown for pedestrians, cyclists, and additional space for restaurants and businesses. Uh, the City and LDDA staff have worked quickly with CDOT and have been granted permit for the closure. We understand, as has just been mentioned, that there are some concerns from the public and other businesses. However, survey results show that a majority of respondents support the plan. And I know that the LDA is working closely with impacted businesses and some changes have already been made to accommodate that. I believe there's also some concern with the fast pace of this request. The governor and CDOT have also worked very quickly and that is what is often called upon us in a time of crisis. Years of work and planning has brought our downtown area to be something all of Longmont can be proud of. Many of us remember a time when our downtown, the center of our community, was not nearly as vibrant as it is today. But we could be in danger of losing that if we do not use all the available tools to help save our businesses. The Chamber and the LDDA interact daily with businesses that are struggling right now. Some will not be able to survive much longer and some have closed already. In recent messaging from the chamber, and we heard a little bit about this tonight from, from Jeff earlier, um, recent messaging from the chamber and with our regional chamber partners, we've asked everyone to remind themselves of what the phrase we're in this together means. We believe it means putting up with the small and sometimes larger inconveniences we have to undertake to support our local businesses. Lane closures will be one of these inconveniences for us, but it very well could mean survival of our downtown businesses. The chamber asks that the city council support the LDA's request for Main Street closures. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Scott. Okay, next. The next caller, your phone number ends in 696. You've been unmuted. Could you state your name and your address for the record? You have three minutes. Caller 696, do you hear me? I'm going to put you on mute again and we'll come back to you. Perfect. Caller 439, you've been unmuted. Caller 439, yeah, is, yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, this is Devin Quince, 911 Venice Street in the Downtown Business Center. I'm just, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm just calling in in support of LDDA's proposal to reduce traffic on Main Street to um, enhance the business properties and allow people more space to social distance and enjoy our downtown. Um, it's been proven over and over again that people walking, biking are the ones who bring business to a downtown, not people driving by at higher speeds. I think this is gonna make downtown a more pleasant place to be 
um, at least for the next three months, and uh, hopefully we can look at doing something longer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's try that last one again. Guest, whoop, I guess they just left. All right, last one. Guest 897, do you hear me? I've just unmuted you. Hello? Guest 897, would you like to speak? All right, let's go ahead and conclude. First call public invited to be heard. And if that person um, comes back, they can get in at the end. They can call in and, and, and express their concerns. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, consent agenda and introduction and reading by title of first reading of ordinances. Don, can you go ahead and read those for us? I can, Mayor. Item 8A is resolution 2020-55, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and St. Brain Valley School District for the water fixture replacement pilot project. 8B is resolution 2020-56, a resolution of the Longmont City Council authorizing agreements between the city and St. Brain Investors LLC for the purchase of real property for the resilient St. Brain project. Item 8C is resolution 2020-57, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Colorado Department of Transportation for a special use permit for restaurant and retail use of state highway right of way, including waiver of use fee. Item 8D is resolution 2020-58, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city of Longmont and the Federal Aviation Administration for grant funding under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act. 8E is resolution 2020-59, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Board of County Commissioners of Weld County, Colorado, and all other Weld County municipalities for co collaboration agreement related to distribution of CARES Act funds. And 8F is resolution 2020-60, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Boulder County, the city of Boulder, the city of Lafayette, the city of Louisville, the town of Erie, the town of Jamestown, the town of Lyons, the town of Netherland, the town of Superior, and the town of Ward, for Boulder County Collaboration Agreement related to the distribution of CARES Act funds. And Mayor Staff has a brief presentation on item 8C. All right, Councilmember uh, Christensen. I would like to pull 8C. Do you want to move the consent agenda? Uh, sorry, Councilmember Waters. I'd like to pull 8A. Mayor you're, Mayor, you're muted. Well, I moved. I moved the consent agenda. Less items eight A and eight C. Second. All right. So we moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Oppo opposed, say nay. All right. The consent agenda minus eight A and eight C passes un unanimously. Um, Harold, can we go ahead and have the eight C presentation, please? Um, were you going to go to second reading first? Oh, yeah, let's do that. Good point. Good call, Carol. All right, let's move on to 9A, uh, ordinances on second reading and public hearings on any matter. Um, we're going to go ahead and ask everybody to go ahead and call in the number if you have any uh, comments or questions. Uh, ordinance A, or Ordinance 2020-26, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities to the city of Longmont for fiscal year beginning January 1, 2020. Uh, do you have a report, Harold? Um, yes, Mayor, we have a brief presentation from, I don't know if it's Jim or Teresa. So if we could go ahead and ask people to call in for 9A and 9B as well at this time, uh, go ahead and call in and uh, go ahead and, and we'll, we'll go ahead and take public hearing after we hear your brief presentation, Harold. Yep. Teresa, is it you or Jim? One moment, Teresa. You should be all set. 
Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Teresa Malloy, Budget Manager. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, so th this evening we wanted to take just a brief moment and update you on this additional appropriation. So each year at about this time, um, each year we do bring our carryover um, appropriation to you. And since uh, this is our carryover, it is a very large appropriation much larger than the appropriations that you typically see from us throughout the year. So this appropriation is uh, 140, almost $140.3 million. Um, it includes 35 different funds. And for ease, we have broken this appropriation into two components and presented them separately in our council communication for you. So the first component is uh, 1.2 million of this is uh, new dollars. So these are, uh, this is appropriation for funds that you have not yet seen in any prior year um, or any prior appropriation. So, so this is essentially the type of appropriation that we typically bring you um, each, um, each month. Um, so that comprises $1.2 million of this $140 million appropriation. The bulk of this appropriation, however, $139 million is carryover from 2019 or, or prior years um, as well, because in some cases we have been carrying some of these funds for a, a few years now. And so this appropriation in total brings our, uh, our total 2020 budget at this point in time to $495.5 million. And what I wanted to do was just um, talk to you a little bit about the, um, the carryover piece. Um, so certainly if you have questions on the new dollar piece, I can answer that for you, but I'm gonna skip down to the um, carryover piece. And in the council communication, we call this unexpended carryover items from 2019. Um, and so um, our city charter um, states that all appropriations will lapse at the end of the year in all funds except our public improvement fund. And uh, so for projects, mainly capital improvement program projects, where we have um, full funding for the project appropriated, um, but those funds are not spent, we need to carry those over to continue those projects. So, so the bulk of what you see in this appropriation is, is carryover of, um, dollar-wise, is carryover of our CIP program. Um, you will, however, see some other um, carryover items. So, so other one-time type expenses that we have budgeted in 2019, but those um, projects were not completed and we still are um, actively working on completing those projects, those are included as well. And the other type of carryover that you will notice in this, um, in our council communication is um, dollars for grants that we have received in um, prior years that um, you council did um, appropriate through an additional appropriation ordinance last year. Um, but again, those grants um, were not fully expended. So those are slightly presented slightly different in our council communication, rather than showing them coming from fund balance as most of the rest of our additional appropriation items um, are indicated. These ones you do see an offset of, um, of revenue. So even though we're offsetting it by revenue, it, it is from this perspective carryover. Um, and so um, just a, a couple, wanted to highlight just a couple items for you. One of the big um, projects that is included in, in this carryover is our, is our Windy Gap project. Um, and and that, it, that's a, a very large project. It's $35.58 million in the water fund. It's $4.12 million in the water construction fund. 
it's almost uh, $5.6 million in the Water Acquisition Fund. So those dollars are all being carried over for that specific purpose. We also have um, in, in several different funds, carryover of our Resilient St. Brain project. Um, so, the, so another big project that's being carried over. And then in our CDBG fund, we have $16.7 million of CDBG disaster recovery funds um, from our flood event that um, is still unspent funding that we are carrying over. So those are just the, the few that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, I can certainly um, answer any questions that you have on any of these other items, or if I can't speak to them specifically, I know we probably have um, staff in, in the audience that, that can help as well. All right, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, seeing uh, no other questions, let's go back to the actual ordinance and open it for public hearing. Do we have anybody in the queue? Yes, Mayor, we have one individual. I'm going to admit them. Thank you. Caller 696, I'm going to unmute you if you can go ahead and speak. Uh, okay. do, you, do you hear us? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all. My name is Hayden Peacock. I'm the owner of the Chinese Medicine Clinic for 10 years down at the intersection of 4th and Main. And uh, we have... 200 plus patients that see us monthly uh, downtown. I'm here to say that this proposal is gonna cause chaos downtown. It's going to eliminate 100 parking spaces from Main Street that there is no good plan in order to be able to do anything about in terms of relieving congestion and parking for downtown. I'm, excuse me, Most, I'm sorry, Mr. Peacock, I'm sorry. So, so right now, you, you, I mean, theoretically, you can take your three minutes and say anything you want, but right now we're talking about a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for the expenses of the budget. Okay, well, I was, I was cut in to talk, and, and this is what I was intending to talk about, and I got cut off earlier. Um, right. Again, it's, it's, it's freedom of speech. Go ahead. Take your, take your remaining, remaining time. That's fine. I apologize. Okay. Um, so, you know, it, it puts the finger on the scale for certain businesses above others. And the person that called in earlier that was suggesting that the LDDA is working with all businesses downtown is not being forthcoming about what's happening. I'm downtown. I'm trying to work with the LDDA to have conversations with them. They don't particularly want to hear what, what we have to say. And on their website, it suggests that one of the goals of the, of the LDDA is to maintain a diverse range of businesses and prevent displacement of existing businesses. And this proposal is going to do exactly that. We do not have any kind of parking stability downtown in order to be able to accommodate what they are talking about doing. And I, if we had more time and insane minds could rule the day here, we would end up in a position where we could have longer conversations about, re, you know, redoing the entirety of downtown Longmont based on unelected people that don't have any consequence for the decisions they make. It's the businesses that are gonna suffer because of this. So I appreciate everyone's time. Sorry, I'm in the wrong spot here, but I was on the call earlier and got cut off. And I, and I right. do appreciate when you finish. That, 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 that's all right. Thank you, Mr. Pe Thank you very much, Mr. Picard. Mm -hmm. All right, is there anybody else in the queue? No, Mayor, not at this time. All right, uh, Dr. Waters? Move approval of uh, ordinance 2020-26. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by Councilmember Christensen. All in favor, uh, vote aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, let's move on to um, item 9B, ordinance 2020-27, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of a five-foot-wide electrical utility easement within the Brook. Brusel subdivision conveyance plat filing one generally located east of Mountain Crest Court south of Maxwell Avenue and west of High Plains Drive. Uh, do we have a motion? I move approval. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Martin, it's been seconded by Councilmember Christensen. Um, do we have anybody in the queue for public hearing? No, Mayor, we do not. All right. Seeing no further debate, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed say nay. All right. The motion uh, passes unanimously. 
Let's move back to item 8C. Harold, I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and have that brief presentation now, if you don't mind. Actually, you know what? Let's do 8A first. Let's get that one out of the way. Who pulled that one? Was that you, Dr. Waters? It was. Let's do 8A first. All right. You, 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 you want to put that one first because you think that one's going to go really fast. <laughs> That's true. Maybe I'm wrong. I've been wrong so much the last year. <laughs> well, it will probably go fast. And I... Uh, uh, to council members, and I, I, I spoke with Dale about this yesterday, uh, I, I likely will vote in favor of this, but I do have some questions, and I don't know if Dale or Ken or uh, Francie, who would be the right pe uh, person to ask, but, I, but I'll start with this. Based on the write-up, it looks like, based on our um, audit of, the, of uh, the efficiency of the fixtures uh, in the elementary school, uh, we concluded, and the school district concluded, that um, they could reduce consumption substantially in the school by doing this retrofitting of fixtures uh, and, and related water controls. Is, is that a fair conclusion to what we've read? Dale, are you taking that one? Dale, why don't you, Dale, why don't you take that one? Or Francie. One yeah. moment, Dale. Do you got it? Francie, yeah. The, um, Council Member Waters, that's correct. We um, we worked with the school district to, to identify this uh, particular school, um, partly as a as a pilot demonstration to see how how effective it is in a um, um, you know a school setting. We're also trying to do this obviously as an education effort with the students, and so multiple things we're trying to accomplish through it. So Dale, uh, you know my question here is um, uh, the fact that we're working with the school district is a good thing. The fact that we're auditing efficiency is a good thing. Uh, what I'm puzzling over is wh why the city um, is reimbursing the school district $25,000 to retrofit equipment that this, the school district, why wouldn't the school district be doing that on its own? Why do we need to be reimbursing? School district's gonna benefit by lower costs the whole community is going to benefit by greater conservation. The environment is going to benefit by greater conservation. Why do we create an incentive for a school district? By the way, it just announced a short time ago they were going to they could, they had enough money in their reserves to build a swimming pool and cover operational costs. It just it just it seems odd to me that the that the city reimburses the school district to do what they should be doing anyway. All right, I changed my mind. Let's go on to eight C. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. If, I, I think I can respond to some of that, um, but uh, Council Member Waters and, and Mayor Bagley and Council, um, I, I, I clearly understand your your, um, your your question there. What I would say to that is that um, the school district is not otherwise required to do anything right now. Uh, the current fixtures that they have in their school um, meet all of the, there's, there's, there's no law on the books, I should say that would require them to move forward now to achieve greater levels of efficiency. And so um, that's why we seek out partners to try to do this with. Um, it, 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 that's part of it. And, and, and my guess is, could the school district afford to do this? They, they very well may. But if you look at the, uh, the multitude of schools that they have across the district, they may or may not be able to do this, you know, district wide. I think the district is as interested in, in the effort as we are to see how effective it is. Our hope is that we're going to show that you're right. They're going to save money. Um, it's going to help educate the kids on low water use uh, fixtures and we'll see where it goes. I mean, that, that's part of the thing. This may be a one and done. We may do it one time and find out it, it wasn't as successful as we hoped for. But I think that's part of the reason why we are wanting to partner with them. So, so Dale, for us to know, requires um, setting some performance targets and collecting data. Yes. Uh, the, the last conversation I was in as a council member regarding data in the school district, uh, the, school, the school district refused to share data with the city uh, to support a proposed a proposal, a grant proposal to secure funding to install a traffic signal that would increase the safety of children 
crossing county line or um, airport road, as I recall. Okay. Airport. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, how how confident are we that this is that this what's different about this that the school district would provide or share data on this project when when our previous experience has been that they do, they don't or choose not to. I, I think one of the key differences here is it's the uh, the city owns the water meter. And so we have access to the data. Um, and so we will, um, it'll really be on, incumbent on the city in this case to share the data also with the district on what we're doing. So we will be already having the data, if you will, in our hands. We will then be able to do the analysis on the data. So we're not dependent upon the school district for data collection? No. Okay. Uh, last question, and, then I, and I'll mute myself. I'll, I'll ask one more question. I'll move approval, and then I'll mute myself and listen. Uh, but the last question is this: um, uh, This is this is about water conservation, and 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 what what might make a difference in one school, and then could be generalized to others. Um, is the swimming pool proposal that we've read about in the newspaper is is that going to con um, conserve or use? more water than, than, this, than the uh, school district is using right now. Uh, are you asking me a question on that, Council yeah. Member? Yeah, yeah, I am. Well, I know it's would, just speculation. It would increase their water demand, um, I would certainly assume. Yeah, yeah, that's, those are the things that are, you know, I just look at and wonder about the logic of it all. Um, like I said, I told Dale and I, and I and to, for council members, I'll, I'll move approval. Um, but it's a head scratcher for me in a lot of ways. Second. All right, it's been moved by Dr. Waters and seconded by Councilmember Martin. Seeing no for the debate, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, uh, item 8A passes unanimously. Now let's go on to 8C and uh, talk about the uh, CDOT stuff, Main Street, et cetera. Harold. So um, we have um, Bill Greenwald. I think Tyler's on the line. Phil's going to do a, a, a factual sort of overview of this of what we're talking about here. Kimber Kimberly's on the line, and she's going to talk about the DDA perspective. And I believe we also have Chris, um, who is the board chair of the Downtown Development Authority, um, that's going to speak to this with Kimberly. Um, so, Phil, do you want to start out? Yeah, Mayor, I'm going to Can turn you it share over. Your, yeah, do you have the map? Are you going to share your screen, or is Susan going to do that? We're going to do that once uh, Chris introduces the topic, and Kimberly uh, okay. has a little introduction. So I'll turn right. it over to Chris for uh, discussion. All right. Thanks, Phil. Mayor Bagley, City Council, City Manager, thank you all for your time and your leadership. Uh, Chris McGilvray, Vice Chair of the LDDA Board, Chair of the Longmont Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, Main Street Business Owner. Uh, we've never experienced anything like COVID-19 and its economic and community impacts. We've never experienced such a dramatic change in our town. Think about this. Just six months ago, Longmont rank was ranked number one boomtown in the country. We had record unemployment rates. We had a thriving economy. We had a thriving downtown. Uh, a lot has changed in six months. I think we all can agree. Uh, we've experienced sudden shuttering of many of our local businesses that have resulted in significant loss in jobs and sales tax revenue. And just a couple of days ago, my favorite breakfast shop downtown closed, Tangerine. And this was a business that made significant contributions to our downtown. So, I wish I was here to say that it's going to get better super quickly, but our recovery is going to take time and a lot of patience. Economic sustainability is a top priority for our city and as an LDDA. So the question is, what creativity can we do to support economic sustainability for our downtown and for our small businesses? What creativity can we do to support economic sustainability? It was this question that shaped the context of the recommendations that are for, before you all to discuss today, the Main Street closure. Uh, now is the time more than ever for creativity, innovation, community collaboration uh, 
to bring attention, people and commerce to the heart of our town, which is our downtown and do it in a safe and compliant manner. The LDDA board appointed a task force and a marketing committee recently to look at this question. What can we do to support our businesses? We heard from retailers that restaurants are a driving factor in the foot traffic for our downtown community. We've experienced an unprecedented amount of unused parking in our lots, and we've heard the wor that the worries and concerns of all types of businesses on how they will make it through this health crisis. We spent years investing in our downtown community. We feel that it was stronger than ever before and that we had historically low vacant rates. We had highly engaged new businesses and more feet on the street than ever before. Downtown has the largest concentration of locally owned businesses in our community. It's, it's truly what Main Street America is all about. The LDDA board encourages you to be creative with ways we can make our downtown a safe and sustainable destination for all. This is an experiment. This is not etched in stone. This definitely has an eraser at the end of a pencil. This is not a new idea, but has been continually suggested and discussed in our community. There are other communities that are using similar type approaches such as Greeley and Louisville. So I was one of the earlier in this process, which feels like forever ago, it was about 30 days ago, we began to vet the viability of Main Street closure of lanes. And my first reaction may have been similar to your first reaction. Are you serious? Our Main Street, do you realize it's a state highway? You're, you're contemplating closing lanes. So there was personal resistance that I had to this idea in the beginning. And um, the chaos that was mentioned earlier that it may create. Um, going through the process of vetting the viability through um, a lot of community discussions with the Business uh, Resilient Task Force, with our business community, with the Chamber of Commerce, and as well as surveying our business owners that are going to be in this area and property owners, I've changed my mind. I see that the positives outweigh the negatives. Some of the positives are that it's going to stimulate, hopefully, the goal is, is that it stimulates economic development. It could increase the vibrancy of our downtown short term, right? This is not a long term play. This is a short term play. It could increase sales for our restaurants and retailers to create a unique experience. When you're driving through downtown during this time, you may slow down because there's something cool happening. It's pretty exciting. And you may just find a parking spot a block to the right or the left and take your family out to dinner and buy something at a retail shop. It's going to encourage us to slow down, hopefully, and buy stuff. And so the LDDA, through this process, we conducted a survey to look at the viability of this process. And what we found is 72% of those that took the survey indicated initial support. There was some concerns. 16% had significant concerns. And looking at the themes of those concerns that emerged from the survey and these thoughtful discussions that we had, it came, it, it was basically traffic congestion was a big concern and parking. Those were by far the two biggest concerns, which Kimberly will, will discuss what we uh, are looking at in terms of responding to some those concerns. We do have to be mindful that this will impact um, the, those in the downtown. We're not naive to think that this is gonna be easy for everybody because it's not going to be. Um, we don't have all the answers and we can't see into the future, uh, but we do believe that this is worth a shot. Uh, thank you again for your leadership during this time. And I'd like to pass the baton to the LDDA Executive Director, Kimberly McKee. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Mayor um, and members of Council. Kimberly McKee, Executive Director of the Downtown Development Authority. As you all know, these are unprecedented and trying times for our business community and our residents. Uh, with this ever-changing climate, things are moving at a very rapid pace. So we just wanted to talk about a time frame or a timeline of what we've explored. We've worked with businesses to navigate guidelines of how and when they would be able to reopen. 
I worked with um, our folks in traffic and assistant ma city manager, Joni Marsh, to investigate how and which businesses could expand into the alleys. And I know that a lot of people are asking why that is not the option. Most of our res restaurants and businesses are fronted to Main Street. That's how they were built 100 years ago. Um, so this option doesn't allow for an immediate uh, line of sight for those businesses, causing them the need to have additional staff to do a lot of setup, tear down. Uh, the alleys are still the primary spine for trash deliveries and other ongoing activities. I can ensure you that our businesses are working very hard to reinvent the way they serve our community. They are working tirelessly to balance staff with inconsistent customer counts and other obstacles. This is not the, uh, a case of them not wanting to try. Believe me, they're trying everything that they can. Um, we did work with a few businesses that are able to utilize the alley, but it was not a very widespread desired option. For the past nine years, I can't tell you the amount of times the LDDA has been told that we need to make our, to make our downtown stronger, we should make it a pedestrian mall, or we should have one lane of traffic in each way with di diagonal parking, or we should build a tunnel for cars underneath the street. People are craving this kind of uh, pedestrian environment. We've heard this again over and over uh, as a suggestion to help with COVID-19. Um, so many people have told me about their experiences in Louisville, in Boulder, in all of these other communities that are using their streets for this type of purpose. Our answer was always no, this is a CDOT highway and they would not allow this. To our surprise on June 11th, Governor Polis announced the Can Do Community Challenge challenge, asking local communities and their resident businesses to find new opportunities to restart commerce in ways that are safe and sustainable. This includes finding innovative ways to reuse our public spaces and help more businesses thrive in a world of social distancing. He encouraged CDOT to work with communities to open up its right of way for businesses and allow the community more space to socially distance while patronizing our local business community. This initiative allowed for us to truly investigate the idea of rethinking how we use Main Street. Downtown was where our community began, an intimate environment where businesses are fronted to the sidewalk. It is intentionally a pedestrian environment. That is an important asset to our businesses, but it also offers unique challenges when we expand into the outdoors. I forwarded you all a recommendation letter from Boulder County Public Health on the importance of outdoor spaces. Research and surveys done by the Downtown Boulder Partnership, which we uh, got the results of, uh, they surveyed 1,000 Boulder County residents. It shows that people are more comfortable with outdoor activities. That survey in mid-May showed that 18% of Boulder County residents were ready to go inside a restaurant, but 50% would go outside. So you can see there's a huge difference in the comfort of Boulder County. Knowing this, city staff put together an application for the permit of a one-lane closure and was approved by CDOT and the federal government to use the right of way. We envision this as a place where people can not only patronize businesses, but spend time outdoors in an urban environment. We hope that this is a place where people can bike and walk. We understand that there is still conversation about how we can do all those things safely within this space, but we at the DDA are committed to working toward a solution to allow all of these activities happen within that space. We've been working with the Longmont Museum on their historic walking tour. If this is passed, we're gonna put different markers out on the street, as well as have our creative community come out to provide art. We have identified lighting banners and other things that will create a true sense of place within this corridor. We'll be work we hope to work with Visit Longmont um, to encourage um, tr safe travel within Colorado uh, for people to come and join our main street. As Chris said, we understand that traffic and parking are a concern. We are embarking on a $7 million project that will make Kaufman Street a transit spine. To alleviate congestion, we can offer an alternate route to take Kaufman between 1st and 9th, looking at signage to tell people who do not want to sit in this temporary lane closure can use Kaufman as a spine. If, we have been, if you have been downtown lately, you may have noticed that we have more available parking than ever before. With most of the workforces at 50% or lower, we are not seeing the parking concerns of the past. Last year, this would have been a different conversation. I've been working with Carmen Ramirez and her parking team to audit the lots for the past week. In the morning and the afternoon, they take their um, observations of what kind of parking that we have. They have never seen any of our lots or streets exceed 80% capacity, and there are very few that hit that mark. Most of the 
parking lots and streets tend to be only between 25 and 66 percent full at one time. There is more parking downtown than we've ever seen before. As a backup, if we do see some parking congestion, we are talking to um, the Elks and a few other folks about private lots that will help add to that supply if needed. As you may know, we have heard a significant amount of concerns from the 300 block, 300 west block of Main Street. The recent announcement that Tangerine is closing and today the governor's order to close bars and pubs again, the DDA staff has worked to devise a plan to use excess sidewalk space on 3rd Avenue for the southernmost restaurants and, alter and have identified some alternative space for some retail classes. Although not our original vision, council may want to consider stopping the closure at 4th Avenue on the west side of Main Street. It is disappointing to some of the business owners on that block, but we would like to be mindful of the concerns um, of those business owners that have such concerns about this and make some accommodations if we can, or, or you all would be able to if you wanted to. As Chris said, this is truly what Main Street America is all about, and we are working on some solutions. This is an experiment, one that is not a new idea, but one that has been continually suggested by our community. We don't have the, all of the answers and we can't see into the future, but we do believe that this is worth a shot. Um, an ideal situation would be to keep the closure through mid to the end of September. In these unprecedented times, we will strongly monitor and evaluate the impacts. Tyler and Phil can speak more on what they will track from traffic impacts. And we will monitor our pedestrian counts, our parking supplies, track sales tax, and really look at what this is doing for downtown as a whole. The loss of our business community, the loss of our local business community impacts all of us. We are working hard to retain what we have worked so hard to build together. Downtown Longmont has bigger hearts and we hope soon stronger streets. Our hope is that a rising tide raises all ships and that this will help all businesses. We won't know whether this works or not, again, unless we try. Um, I will turn it over to Phil and Tyler to more fully discuss how those closures would work. Good evening, Council. This is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. Um, I think rather than go into the details, we just turn it over to you right now and ask, uh, I'm sure you have some questions about this, uh, this proposal or this uh, resolution for this intergovernmental agreement. So. Um, I would turn it over to council. And if, and if needed, we do have a closure map if you'd like to see that as well. I've just got one question and Marcia, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, call on you. My only question is I commute every day from South Longmont to North Longmont. And, my, and uh, a lot of us commute from North to South, South to North. And uh, I am inclined to vote for this. My only question is, have we done a traffic study to, I mean, I've got 20 employees that are making that commute, how much, time are they going to be you know every day um how, how much time are they going to lose in their commute if they're coming up 287 as a result of of the going from two to one yeah mayor uh, thanks for that question we we uh, have not done a detailed sir, or a detailed analysis of actual loss of time on those travel times yet but we are going to measure them very uh, carefully and make sure that we are not adding many, many minutes to your commute as far as that goes. But uh, maybe Tyler uh, has some more information about actual uh, trip making efforts through that area as we shut down those lanes. I will just mention, I do want to mention that we are asking RTD and they are saying that they will move buses over to Kimbark. So we're going to move the bus traffic off of Main Street to help you get through this area, help everyone get through this area. We're also, um, as you've heard earlier, we're eliminating parking, which is also takes up quite a bit of that uh, outside lane right now, as far as uh, removing some of that capacity as people try to stop in traffic and then back into a parking space. So those those two elements will be eliminated with this proposal. And I'll turn it over to Tyler. So you give me your word that it's not going to be substantial. Is that what you're saying? I would like to do that. Council Tyler Stamey, <laughs> Transportation right. Engineering Administrator. Um, so. so so not sugarcoated it, your, your travel times are going to go up. We do fully anticipate that. We are measuring travel times between first and ninth right now. We're going to measure those travel times as this setup is implemented and as it continues. So we'll have that number to report, but I don't have a model run to, to really estimate what that impact is gonna be at that point. This kind of came together 
relatively quickly. And to do that type of model takes a, a pretty substantial modeling effort that frankly, we didn't have the time to do right now. Um, I will say we have done this similar setups before with construction as we were going through, I think it was 2017 repaving or reconstructing Main Street. We had times when we had traffic down to one lane each direction and shifted onto one side of the street. I think what we saw with that was a lot of drivers picking alternate routes. And so I think we saw volumes go down. Um, one of the other things we see right now um, as we're watching, we're checking volumes across town and impacts to stay at home orders I, on, on Main Street in particular, we saw a pretty good reduction in the first couple of weeks with stay at home orders. We saw traffic volumes go down about 60% of their normal, normal what we'd see on a normal day. That has come back. We're at about 90% of pre-COVID volumes. So volumes are a little bit lower than normal. So that, that's in our favor right now as we're looking to do something like this. But ultimately, travel times on that route. Unfortunately, your route, Mr. Bagley, will be impacted by this. OK, yeah, the, the, I guess the only I'm going to vote vote tonight, but I'd, I'm going to I don't know how much time or money we want to dedicate to this, but I, I'd have that. I, I'm all for this and I hear everybody's uh, I hear Kimberly McKee and I hear Chris McGilvery and I hear I, I, I in theory, it's great for downtown. My question is, what's the trade off? Hundred thousand people, other businesses in town are not located in the downtown district and I want to see the downtown district thrive question is at what expense because uh if other people and i'm not saying that oh this is all about the bag of law firm. i'm not saying that what i'm saying is i'm assuming that if i've got employees that are going to say yeah i don't want to drive up there anymore if you add 10 minutes to their commute as they're coming in from lafayette and broomfield i'm assuming other businesses would also have a similar problem so i guess my question is what's the give and take so i'm going to vote for it tonight but I, I'd, I'd like to know i mean if it's if it's 15 minutes, that's terrible. If it's two minutes, not a big deal. All right, Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, uh, I have been doing two things. One is looking at uh, national and international data about projects like this. And they seem to have in common a, a lot of initial resistance in terms of, of um, people believing that, uh, that uh, their business needs to be driven straight up to in order to thrive and things like that. Um, and the other thing, um, the, the, and finding that the outcomes turn out favorable uh, after all, and the situation resolves itself to be for the benefit of, of everybody. Uh, the other thing I've been doing is listening to the local objections and uh, seeing what people are, are really finding as the problem. So I have two questions about the local objections. Uh, one of them is, um, what do we do with the bicycle traffic? And it seems to me that the bicycle traffic falls into two cases. Uh, one is the through bicycle traffic that isn't gonna stop at downtown, but is gonna be, um, possibly disrupted by the rerouting of traffic. Um, and the other one is uh, how are cyclists going to be accommodated that are headed downtown, which is uh, something that they have always said, yeah, we need, we, we want to bike downtown, make it work for us. So um, those are the two questions. You can answer them in either order you'd like, as long as you tell me which one you're answering. Uh, and then, um, I'm sorry, the bicycle question is really one question. The other question is, uh, I've been looking at the parking in the back on Kim Bark and Kaufman and seeing that regardless of the through traffic on Maine, those parking lots are just not as full as they used to be. Um, can we make more parking for disabled persons back there um, so that the alley entrance uh, works uh, for less abled people or differently abled people because I think solving that problem uh, is, for example, going to address a lot of Mr. Peacock's concerns. And um, if, if that's part of the plan, then I feel a lot better about it. 
Well, I guess I'll take a shot at the um, question, Mayor and, and Councilmember Martin. Um, starting with your bicycle question, I think what we're doing is we're really trying to still work with the avenues that are very low volume right now and getting people into downtown through those avenues. And I think that's been working really well. I know I, you know, as a, as a bicycle commuter myself, I use Fourth Avenue quite a bit and it's really, really very easy, quite frankly. And Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue uh, are all east and west, very easy to get into downtown. The bigger question is the through downtown that I think you mentioned. And we really have been pushing uh, bicyclists to use the alleyways. And I understand that there are some issues with partial closures of the alleyway to traffic, but I think that they're still open for bicycle use. And Kimberly, feel free to chime in if, if this is incorrect information. But my, inform my information is that most all those alleyways still remain open to bicycling. Um, and then when we do place the barricades, this is kind of my issue, and I, I've talked to a number of you about this, is that I originally last Monday talked to the Bicycle Issues Committee that's kind of a, a group that we use to link in and, and communicate with the bicycle community. And I did tell them that we thought we were gonna have room to bicycle with these closures on Main Street. And after kind of discussing it and talking about actual space needs, uh, we weren't sure if that was true or not. And so I had to kind of back off of that a little bit and it caused some consternation within the bicycling community. And I certainly apologize for that. But I think we're just trying to be on the safe side, err on safety here and just say that we don't know exactly what this is gonna look like. And uh, when, when the barriers come down, we've got 17 feet of space for the, the, the travel lane and the parking lane. So you know that's not gonna be very much space. You put a three foot wide uh, barricade in there, you put it two feet away from traffic, there's five feet gone from, from that 17 feet. So now you're working with 12 feet. So it just becomes this rule of numbers, but things can move around. And I think once we set the barricades, uh, that area re really becomes the area for the, for the businesses. Uh, we're gonna make sure that traffic flows freely on Main Street, but uh, behind those barricades, uh, we're going to try to create, I believe LDDA is going to try to create some space for the bicycling to go north and south as well on that because we realize that Kaufman and Kimbark are going to be busy with increased traffic loads and, and they're not really great places to ride bicycles right now with diagonal parking backing out. So hopefully that answers your first question about bicycles. Um, uh, as far as the parking goes, you know, if you have a handicap placard, you can park anywhere uh, in the downtown for as long as you want to. Um, and so we are taking away those those spaces in the front, um, but there are no right now there are no handicapped parking spaces on Main Street. They're, they are all in the you know those at those um, city parking lots or the LDDA parking lots that are off of Kimbark and Kaufman. So technically we do not have any ADA parking uh, where you can park with the placard um, and and have that spot saved for you. So that is kind of a non-issue in our mind, but we would like to take a look at what we need to do for those parking lots and make sure that there is access. But again, if you have the handicap plat placard and we're talking about 25 to 66% utilization in those, in those parking lots, you can use that parking placard and park anywhere in any time spot for as long as you want. Um, and so that, that kind of goes under the radar a little bit. And I'll just turn it over to my colleagues to chat any more about if I missed something on that. Oh, thanks, Phil. I just wanted to say I was unaware that the time limitations didn't apply if you have a handicap placard. So that's excellent information and definitely satisfies my concern. Mayor, you're muted. You're Council muted. Member Christensen and then Council Member Peck, I see in the bottom. Um, okay, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Councilwoman Martin for asking those questions. Those are two of my concerns to the ADA and the, the bicycling. Um, I really would like to have bicycling a bicycling lane. I, I'm having a hard time picturing what this is going to look like. Now it seems like we're going to have um, one lane of traffic, but then we're going to have a whole bunch of barricades. Uh, is that right? Because I went down today and I mentioned, I, I measured 
the sidewalk, the regular sidewalk is 18, about 18 feet. So they already have 18 feet, um, but we also actually have to still use it as a sidewalk. People have to be able to get up and down it. So I'm wondering how much extra space people will actually be gaining by this. Um, I've been mentioning Louisville for years and years and nobody seems to be very interested. Now I'm heartened to see that people are sort of interested in <laughs> what Louisville has done. Although they're, they're, they have a different situation and a different kind of town, but they just close their, they do this every summer. They close off, uh, they, they use the parking space. They put flats out uh, that are basically pallets covered with um, inch thick uh, um, plywood. And the city stores these every year. This evolved over time from a, a, somebody, a city council person actually observing somebody <laughs> doing something rather clever. Um, so they use that parking lane in the summertime as extra seating. Well, that's, um, I don't know how wide a, that parking lane is, 10 feet, 12 feet? I think it's more like seven to eight feet. Oh, okay. Still, that's enough room for a table and chairs. And um, so that would still allow you, if we close down one lane of traffic, it would give them more room if they used that, um, um, parking lane in this, this summer um, to um, put out pallets and expand their tables there, although that would cost them more money. You know, this, this is, we do have to be creative. I went down there tonight and I had dinner, at, my son and I had dinner at the, um, um, at, uh, the pump house. And um, as usual, there was no parking in the parking lot and back. There never is ever, ever, ever in my experience. And so we had to park and walk about three blocks. That's typical for the situation. You know, when you measure stuff in the morning and in the afternoon, that's all well and good, but most people are gonna be down there at night. And at night, it's, it's always packed. You can drive around that parking lot forever and you will not get a parking space there. Um, <laughs> uh, it's the same thing down by the Dickens. I, I, um, I am worried about the parking. I mean, I'm frightened by the fact that I look at all the empty storefronts down there. We had, as, as Chris said, we were doing wonderfully. And our downtown is so much better because of Kimberly. Than when I moved here, when it was just nothing <laughs> 30 years ago. Um, and it's been wonderful and we wanna keep that. It's a huge generator for income, I mean, for jobs, for entertainment, for economic vibrancy in this town. But we also have to have a balance between people who are handicapped having access, the biking, biking being, you know, the biking community being able to get around, um, the neighborhoods not being any more impacted than they already are by down, people parking all over and creating problems all over. Um, so yeah, none of us, uh, none of us here is God. Nobody's got any answers. We have to do the best we can to try to find creative solutions. I'm, I, I see the point of Mr. Christiansen from the uh, uh, Elite Barber Shop. And I also see the, the um, points of Mr. Peacock from the Chinese medicine thing. I do think some businesses will be adversely affected by this and I worry about that. But we have to try to figure out the greatest benefit for everybody to get through this difficult time. So I would vote for this if we, um, if we allow somehow to have a bike lane going through there um, so that bicycles, which are the way that people can get downtown and go to these places. <laughs> I mean, people talk about foot traffic, but people are not gonna be walking from all over downtown to downtown. They have to get to downtown and park. 
And if we are pinching the traffic to 50%, they're gonna avoid downtown like the plague. And then we eliminate parking, they're really gonna avoid it. So I do worry about that. But I think it's worth a try until the end of September. I think we have to try to do something to help people. And um, so I will vote for this provided we have some bike lane, have a bike lane, because otherwise I think it will really be a lot, doing a lot of damage. All right, let's go with Council Member Peck, then Council Member Susie doggle faring and Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. So I have uh, two concerns and uh, I had already asked, Phil, I, I talked to you on the phone about this. So I'm gonna let you explain it because you explained it so well to me. And the question is, well, the normal process for something like this would be that it is brought to council and we put it on an agenda, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that didn't happen. And I was concerned about why the rush? How did this happen? How come we haven't heard about it? And uh, you explained it very well, Phil. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to please let everyone know how, why this is such a rapid response to the business community and to LDDA. Take it away, Phil. Mayor and Councilmember Peck, um, I'm trying to remember what I said, um, but um, um, I think, you know, I think Kimberly did a really great job in explaining kind of that timing. You know, we're talking about June 11th was when we started hearing about this and it's June 30th today. So we're really trying to, um, you know, we really did get uh, quite a kickstart on this as far as, uh, you know, trying to get going with what we had heard and the different things that we heard from um, the different businesses and, and folks. The piece of it that really kind of, uh, I, I think Kimberly really mentioned was the idea that we really looked at the alleys first and that was really where we wanted to go. And, and so alleys really became the key focus initially when we were talking about business expansions. And uh, it was quickly became evident that the businesses couldn't make alleys work as well as they thought they could or as well as we thought they could. So um, the, next, the next option was looking at Main Street, but the very first reaction that everybody had was, who's gonna wanna sit next to four lanes of traffic while they eat their dinner and try to converse with each other? It's already kind of difficult at some of these outdoor seating venues already. So um, what can be done to kind of mitigate that? And that was the idea of, uh, could we take a, a lane and slow traffic down a little bit and calm traffic a little bit with this, with this uh, proposal? So that's kind of what you see in front of you tonight. So if um, I can, if I can jump in to kind of help with that too. So um, when we talked to council about what we were going to look at for the alleys and the process you have to go through liquor licensing and all of those components. Um, while the state relaxed a lot of rules and processes in terms of bringing it through, um, the operational issue also becomes more challenging in terms of the licensing aspect. And Kimberly kind of touched on this is because you have to make sure that you can, when we expand the premise, that you can ensure that you're properly monitoring that premise as part of the licensing process. And, and so there's very few based on access points to the alley that can actually do that. I think there's really only one that has that line of sight. Um, and so then when you take a facility that's challenged financially, and then you add additional costs for them in order to be able to expand, to increase the 50% margin because of the licensing piece, that becomes an additional issue that's in play as well that really has made the alleys more difficult to work, with, work through. So I think that uh, that part, you're right, Kimberly explained it very well. And um, I guess what I was getting at for the conversations that I've had from the residents is that, why are we just hearing about this? How come you're rushing it through? And um, what I understood from our conversation was that uh, you, we, we Harold could do this based upon that emergency uh, authority that we gave you, um, I forgot what it was called already, because uh, we needed to get CDOT on board, we needed to be able to, uh, that was going to take longer than we thought to get their permission, etc. 
So um, it was all fast forwarded uh, that way rather than coming through council and getting it on an agenda and discussing it and carrying it out for a long time. So do I have that correct? Is that because people have been asking, why are we rushing this? When in fact, it is the process that is rushing it, not necessarily um, the need. So I hope I understood you correctly with that. So I can also jump into that one too. So when we talked about the use of alleys, I know we did mention that there was a possibility of looking at Main Street during that conversation. Um, but we also indicated we did not know how CDOT was going to respond. And so what we what we said was we were going to go and work to CDOT and see what they were going to do. Um, because if they weren't going to allow it, um, that would have been a, a lot of work that everyone went through. And I think CDOT then allowed it, which is why we're then bringing it to you all now. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted the residents to hear as to why it went that fast. My other concern uh, actually was brought up tonight and Kimberly mentioned it about uh, the bars and lounges being closed per uh, the governor. So my question is, are the bars within the restaurants going to be closed? For example, the Roost has a bar, the, that does not pertain to them. There's okay. no, uh, based on what I understand from the existing order, um, it is really specific to bars and like night, nightclubs that don't sell food. Okay. Um, and, and so um, there is a distinction in the licenses and in how they operate. Um, and where it gets different is they have created different uh, a different venue for um, breweries and distilleries and they're they're obviously licensed by the state but they created special provisions for that type of license but in terms of bars they don't sell food and so they're they're in a license category uh, that they have specifically closed okay but won't okay. impact those other ones based on well questions. Okay. based on what I know tonight. <laughs> you know, I know, tonight. that's, yeah, exactly. So I have one more question. This is an experiment and I think it's a good experiment and I'm anxious to see what happens with it. And it is a 90 day experiment um, or a little over 90 days. What if within the first 30 to 45 days we find that it has a negative effect on other businesses that the data isn't, we're showing that there are no more people coming to the restaurants than before we put we did this. Are we going to continue it throughout the 90 days or are we going to say this isn't working as we planned and shut it down sooner? Is there any data collection that would make us rethink what we're doing or is it, is it going to be the 90 days period regardless? So Mayor and Council Member Peck, um, just, just to let you know, yes, we are going to evaluate this. We wanna take that first 30 days to look at what's going on with traffic, what's going on with um, all the different businesses that are downtown. And I think Kimberly has some more information on that, but if anything happens where we are seeing this, you know, kind of fall on its face as a failure uh -huh. uh, with traffic or with the businesses, we have the ability to kind of pull those barricades. We, we don't, but we'll get the barricade company to come back in and pull those barricades and uh, uh, take them off of Main Street and return it back to normal. So that's kind of what we're looking at right now is a, is, is a month long kind of test okay. to see how things go and give people time to kind of adapt, you know, give the mayor time to find different routes to get to his office uh, in, the, in the north side of town. But, uh, um, and then everybody, you know, we'll all have to kind of figure this out as we go, I think. Um, and as that happens, we have that ability of things, if things go really south on us. Okay, great, glad to hear it, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and with Council Member Doggle Faring. Harold, were you gonna say something? Uh, just to clarify what Phil said and to answer the question, Kimberly and I did have that conversation today and we talked about if we see certain things, we're gonna, immediately come together and, and, and go, can you deal with it? And if you can't deal with it, then have to reconsider. So uh, there has been ample conversation on that. Okay. Um, so council member Peck had, had asked a 
um, one of the questions I wanted to, to ask um, in regard to if it's not working, you know, so we, we're gonna look, really look at the first 30 days and see what happens if it doesn't work. Um, I'm curious to know how long would it take to do the, the reverse single lane closure? Um, and would it need to be brought forward to council for approval first? Or can you guys just decide, okay, this isn't working, we're gonna have to, to undo this? I think we have the ability to untangle it if there's a problem, but similar to how we've approached many of these issues, um, we would communicate with council to say, here's what we understand, here's what's happening, here's what we need to do. Um, so we would communicate with council on that issue. If you would like, we could bring it back to you. Um, I'd just be afraid if it's not working, that's we're going to lose time. And so I'd rather. I didn't want any of that to be a delay. Yeah, yeah no. Do now to to um, ex, uh, you know expedite that process. I wanted to get that on the record now. The other one was um, if oh the, as far as funding for this, are we able to acquire any um, federal funding, COVID relief for the the blockage of the road? What's it going to cost for the barriers and um, and undoing it when we're when it's completed? Mayor and uh, Councilmember Hidalgo Faring, uh, this is uh, this is a great question because we are currently uh, uh, pursuing a grant from the state. The, the state has actually put together a funding program of four point one million dollars uh, with a fifty thousand dollar maximum request, and we are going for that full fifty thousand dollars, and we think that'll pay for almost half of this, or more than half of it. Hopefully, is what we're we're, we're saying ninety to to one hundred thousand dollars. Is that correct, Tyler? Okay, so, um, you know, we're trying to get about half of the money from the state. We've got some of our best grant writers working on that uh, issue right now. So we're hoping, hoping we can get that, those dollars to flowing to the city. Okay, very good. And then this is back to the parking, but on the west side. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking more between third and fourth. And I think we had a talk, Phil, earlier today about this very issue and utilizing how, I wanted to know how receptive the, um, the establishments that have those private parking space um, lots, how flexible are they being in allowing um, other um, customers to utilize those spots for other businesses? Um, Mayor Begley um, and council members, I did talk to, um, start a conversation with the Elks Lodge. So they have a, uh, parking lot that's immediately adjacent to ours and I was asking them um, what type of usage they were seeing and if they anticipated any larger events or if they would be willing to work with us to either lease us or allow us to um, use some of that parking and they're very very open to that discussion so um, they said yeah you know we could look at something so we thought about waiting to see if the need was there and then kind of initiating that discussion I know that um, uh, some other uh, banks are going to allow for parking um, in their spaces after hours, um, that type of thing, which will also add to the inventory. And, you know, again, as I mentioned in my presentation, since the 300 West block is by far the most sensitive to this, we could always choose not to do the closure in that area, which will preserve all of their parking um, for all of those that I think reached out with you. So could we do a partial closure where on the east side it closes and then the west side that just stays is that a, an option that could be used were yeah. you looking at the entire west side to kimberly or just one block on the west side so between third and fourth is what i was thinking that's what we looked at with Tyler and um, Phil between third and fourth. It would just, the closure would just stop at fourth Avenue and not go down to third on the west side. West side, but yeah. Southbound. On, on the east side, it would actually, um, it would pick up Hefe. So it would take a little bit of that 200 block to pick up that and then possibly Smoke and Dave's if they open, if we do some rearranging and then go up to six to the pump house. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
All right, I think we said Councilmember Martin is next. And then we'll go with Dr. Waters after her. Thank you, Mayor Bagley, I'll be quick. The uh, first thing is I think that a lot of people, uh, especially us over 65 types are uh, going to still be interested in pickup and delivery. And can, um, can that be run, <coughs> excuse me, through the alleys for most of the restaurants? Yes, we absolutely would like to see pickup and delivery um, in the alleys. And I think the alleys are very well suited for that. Um, so most people do have that access to where they could run the food out and do curbside pickup. Um, and we also have the 15 minute curbside pickup spaces. And we may look at putting one of those in the avenues. So if you did want to go to a block, if you had some accessibility issues, some of those spaces would be um, marked for 15 minutes. So you could walk up get your curbside pickup and walk back. So that's another option we could explore. Thank you. And then the uh, my other question is about bike parking when, when um, uh, downtown is the biking destination. Uh, can we make it as safe as possible by, by putting um, uh, the bike racks at the ends of the closures so that, because I don't think there, you're gonna see very many bikers who are gonna have a problem walking three blocks. All right, let's go ahead, uh, Dr. Waters. Do I get an answer on that? Okay. That was a question. Okay, go ahead. Who wants um, to answer? Mayor Martin and Council Member Martin, I think I'll, I'll try to take that one and just say that we've done a lot of work in the last couple of years to really get some, a lot of bike racks in the downtown. I think Kimberly can kind of attest to the, the amount of work we've worked, we've worked with her staff to make sure we get those bike racks. But we can certainly, we have a bike rack program. And if we hear that we need to add racks in any, any location, we could quickly do that as well. I think I was asking about moving bike racks to the ends because if I'm walking around with my drink in my hand, um, I'm, not necessarily eager to have a biker with me on the sidewalk. We will look into that as far as a solution. That sounds like a good one. Thank you. All right, Dr. Waters, now your turn. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Kimberly, uh, in your comment, you made reference to accommodations. Is what you just went through with Council Member Hidalgo Faring in terms of not utilizing or not closing down the, uh, let me see, southbound traffic in the 300 block. Is that the accommodation that you were thinking about or are there other accommodations? That's the um, specific accommodation that we're thinking <clears throat> about um, because that's where we really heard um, the concerns. Uh -huh. um, and so we... so um, related to the, to the question of accommodations, my guess is you and Tyler and Phil talked about uh, creating one-way streets, right? Uh, like northbound Kimbark, southbound Kaufman being one-way streets as opposed to two-way streets. I assume that was at some point a co topic of conversation. And um, I'd just be curious, is that that's not why that wouldn't be worthy of thinking about in terms of traffic flow? Councilman Waters and, and Mayor, um, I think what we were really trying to do is make sure that we had all the streets available in both directions. We've certainly talked about the one-way pairs in the past with different with different folks, but in, not in this conversation. Not This is really about trying to keep some traffic on Main Street and keep that traffic flow going and not completely close off Main Street at this time. So that was uh, not, not a specific consideration for this specific closure yet. Uh, I appreciate the feel it just doesn't answer my question. Uh, why, why wouldn't you? I mean, you're, we're afraid now if we, if you went one way north and, and south, Kaufman and Kimbark, that that takes too much traffic off of, off of Main Street. And if it did, it would be because people traffic was moving uh, smoothly. I, I, I guess that, that confuses me why people wouldn't want to do that. And I don't, and I, and I don't want to get into the weeds on it. I just, in terms of accommodations, it seemed like one of those that might be on the table for consideration. Um, Mayor so, and, and Councilmember Waters, I think the reason why we didn't consider that at this time is it's that's a very expensive 
traffic control plan. And what we're trying to do is keep it simple and a and, and little, little less expensive than what that would take to actually change uh, the traffic flow patterns uh, with, those, with those streets that you mentioned, Kimbark and Kaufman. So that, imagine the, uh, the traffic uh, control that that would take. It's, it's, that's that's uh, probably quadruple the cost of what we're talking about here. So um, we're really trying, we were trying to keep it, we're trying to keep it inexpensive and keep the traffic mo moving and not, uh, not uh, distress or, or, or impact those folks along Kaufman and Kimbark any more than we had to. But maybe Tyler has some other ideas about one-way traffic flow, but th that's, that's kind of my initial reaction to that. All right, uh, unless, unless Tyler, Tyler's gonna jump in. I, I, do, I do wanna go back to Kimberly and to, and to Chris. Um, you know, one of the kind of standards in my mind, and I think Council Member Christensen made reference to the same kind of standard a few minutes ago about um, uh, whatever we decide, doing the greatest good for the largest number, uh, understanding that especially at these times, no matter what decision we make on this or on a bunch of things, masks or no masks, uh, we got a whole bunch of folks out of there who are going to second guess and, not, and be unhappy with whatever we decide. So. Um, Understanding that, we're going to make a decision. Um, so you two make the case that, that this, given the concerns we've heard about a, so maybe a minority of businesses and we've heard from residents, uh, make the case that, that this plan uh, serves the, does the greatest good for the largest number of long months. I guess I'll start, Kimberly. Um, I think it, these are really important questions that you asked, Tim. Um, and the, I, I, we got asked these from so many people. And it's really important to understand that this is not tunnel vision on just restaurants. This is not tunnel vision just on Main Street. This is um, what's best for our community. This is what's best for our city, right? It's adding sales tax. It's saving businesses. It's, I mean, we've always, you know, we're really proud of what we've created in the downtown, right? Coming out of um, implementing our master plan from five years ago and truly executing against our, ma our, our master plan and having it a destination where people are, have fun and it's safe and it's inviting. And we lost a little bit of that, but we're excited about the future. And so, you know, um, it's about identity. It's about, um, you know, the, you, if you look at the sales tax alone that comes out of our downtown and um, Jim can give us more of the specifics, but it's, it's a significant percentage of our city, right? But then there's also the employees, the jobs. Um, we talked about the economic sustainability earlier. Um, all that comes together. This is, you know, it, it, it is, uh, when you look at the results of the survey and this can, in the discussions, Tim, this is not going to, we're not going to please everybody. There are going to be some challenges. That's why it's really important that we continue to have discussions about these concerns around parking and, and traffic congestion and really doing what we can to accommodate those needs, which I'm really impressed with this discussion on those. We're bringing up some really important um, questions. So, um, but, you know, it's our downtown is our city and, you know, I'm, uh, it's, we have to invest in the heart of our town. And that's, that's my argument is um, it is a small sacrifice. It is an experiment, um, you know, and I, I, I asked the same questions that I believe um, Polly asked Phil in terms of what if things go wrong, what do we do? And it, it, it isn't that complex to go back to the things that they uh, basically to go back to normal. And so um, there is a little bit of risk associated with this, um, potentially some frustrations, um, but I think what makes our community so special, Tim, is coming together, right? And for a common purpose. And I think this, that what this sends is when you're driving through downtown, you know, we're obviously in a pandemic. Things are difficult, we're struggling. You're gonna be able to drive downtown and you're gonna see, wow, like something cool is happening. Like, you know, there, there's some vibrance. Maybe I need to pull over and have a slice of pizza, Rosalie's, um, and it's going to create some excitement and some feel-good buzz that, that 
that um, our downtown has missed, obviously, um, through this pandemic. And, um, and so I'm excited for, you know, these micro examples of tapping into our vision, using our imagination to, to try to help, help each other through this. Kim, are you going to add to that? Yeah, if I can just quickly add, um, thank you so much for asking the question. I really feel like this is an investment in people. And the thing that makes Longmont so special is its people. And so sacrificing some parking so people have a space to come to be able to gather safely six feet apart and be able to still have the heart of the community. We really um, base it that everyone that comes to downtown is a pedestrian at some point. We don't have any drive-in movie theaters. Everyone has to walk at some point. So how can we make that safer, more pleasant, give more space for people to come and gather and really embrace our local business community? Well, my last comment, and then I'll, I'll mute, is um, if, if we've learned nothing since March 17th, when the whole world changed, uh, we've all learned that adaptation is um, a requirement going forward. It's been a requirement since March 17th, and there will be no less uh, need to adapt and adapt and adapt and adapt uh, to the conditions as they emerge. So uh, this strikes me for, for whatever controversy or you know anxiety there is around it, uh, an example not just of in innovation, but of the of it's incumbent upon all of us to figure out now how to adapt as we work together in this situation. So I'm going to vote for, I'm going to vote for this um, and, uh, and, and hope that we can all work together continually, either adapt the plan or adapt to the plan as we go forward. All right. And uh, Councilor Christensen, you might be the last word. We'll see. Okay. Um, can we clarify that there'll be bicycling There'll be a bicycle lane. I mean, I know this is sort of up in the air, but it, it makes a difference to me whether I vote for it or not. So, Mayor and, and Council Member Christensen, we are going to make every provision possible that we can to include bicycles on Main Street uh, with the spacing requirements. And I think Kimberly has done an excellent job of trying to find the space and working with the bicycling community and the restaurants to figure out how to make sure there, there's space there. Uh, we'll do the best we can, but there may be places where, where we have to figure out different ways to get bicycles through. So this is just going to be from 2nd to 6th. Is that correct, Kimberly? So on the um, east side of the street, it will start north of the 200 block parking lot. So it'll end up from the 200. I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. Sorry. What? Can, uh, can, on the 200, on the east side of the street, it'll start a little bit north of the 200 block parking lot we have there and go up to the pump house. And okay. then on the west side of the street, um, it will either go from 3rd Avenue to 6th Avenue or from 4th Avenue to 6th Avenue, depending on which route council would like to go. Um, I had another question since you mentioned this would cover Hefe's. Do, does Hefe's want to be part of this? Because right now they have a very good system. They have, and that relies upon having two open lanes and being able to dro drop stuff off at the uh, curb. And I don't believe that they have much in the way of alley access. So wouldn't this negatively impact them? They requested to be part of it, which is why we extended it to there, so. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, and they've know. got a good idea that well, it's their business, so. Well, I do know that Sean, he's part of the Business Resilience Task Force, so he's been very involved through this process, and so I'm pretty sure he's on board. All right, we've gone ahead and I think everybody, that, again, this is just first reading. We have a second reading coming up. I think we've all had the opportunity to say or ask questions. Let's go ahead and vote on 8C. Uh, do we have a motion? Just a point of order. There's no yeah. second reading. No second reading. This no is second, a this resolution. resolution. Uh, yes. You're right. Sorry, it's after 10. I'm starting to get tired. All right, it's a resolution. We're not coming back. Councilmember Peck? I move the resolution. Councilman Martin, second. you want to second that? All right, it's been moved by Councilman Peck, second by Councilman Martin. All in favor, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. All right, it carries unanimously. All right, let's move on to, let's crank through the rest of this um, general business. Let's do 11A, LGID resolution. Um, let's, I move that we recess the Longmont City Council and convene as the board of directors of the Longmont General Improvement District number one. So moved. All right. All right, well, I'll, I'll move and I'll take that as a second. And <laughs> Council Mayor Christensen. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, motion carries unanimously. Let's go ahead and do A2, resolution LGID 2020-03, a resolution of the board of directors of the Longmont General Improvement District number one, enacting a supplemental budget, making an additional appropriation for the expenses and liabilities of the district for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2020. It's pretty clear in our packet, but do we want to keep talking about it? I move resolution 2020-03. All right, thank you, Dr. Waters. That's been moved by Dr. Waters and seconded by Council Member Martin, I believe. Um, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, resolution LGID 2020-03 passes unanimously. I'll move that we adjourn as the Longmont General Improvement District Number One Board of Directors and reconvene as the Longmont City Council. Do I have a second? So moved. Second. All right, I'll say moved by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Christensen. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, passes unanimously. Let's wrap it up with the presentation of the recommendation of the Climate Action Task Force on Renewable Energy, Building Energy Use, and Transportation. Carol? I believe that, um, Dale, are you starting this off or is Lisa starting it off? I'm starting this off. Lisa. All right. All right. Okay, Susan, you can go ahead and start the presentation. One moment. There you go. Thank you so much. Uh, Mayor Bagley, members of council, I'm Lisa Nalbach, the Sustainability Program Manager, and I'm here tonight to review the climate action recommendations that have been developed over the last six months with the Climate Action Task Force, along with the Just Transition Plan Committee. And before I dive into the presentation, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Deputy City Manager Dale Rademacher to provide an introduction. Uh, Susan, you can go to the next slide, please. Thanks, Lisa. Um, the only thing I uh, really wanted to share with council, given the, uh, the late hour of the evening, uh, a couple of things. Uh, council, you passed the emergency uh, ordinance uh, declaring the climate emergency back in October. Um, we were all working in January to have this report delivered to you by April 8th. Um, I, you know, we, we got a few bumps along the way. Um, but I'm very proud to say that uh, Lisa and, and the uh, sustainability staff working with um, awesome members of our community have been able to pull together a report that I believe is gonna help um, guide our community going forward <clears throat> to be able to deal with the, um, the climate challenges that we're gonna have. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa to get underway. Great. Thanks so much, Dale. So as I'm sure you've all seen in your packet, the Climate Action Recommendations Report is quite substantive. So, and luckily, because it's, it's late, so we're going to, uh, we're actually breaking up the presentation over two sessions. So um, tonight and also next week, and I've just listed here what we're, what we'll be covering tonight is we'll go into some of the background of the Climate Action Task Force, uh, review the structure of the report, uh, we have a governance recommendation and community engagement summary and then the bulk of what we'll be discussing are the topic area recommendations excuse me, around building energy use, renewable energy and transportation. And then next week we'll be back to talk about the recommendations in the areas of adaptation and resilience, education and outreach, land use and waste management. And then we'll be discussing equitable climate action and reviewing the Just Transition Plan Committee equity recommendations and then getting into a discussion with council around how you want to all want to move forward now that the report is completed. The next slide. Uh, oh, and real quickly, just um, to note why I'm doing this presentation as as staff is um, due to the comprehensive nature of the of the report itself and the recommendations. Uh, the Climate Action Task Force had requested that staff present and the, the report and recommendations. And although we did provide a lot of support and resources and information to the Climate Action Task Force to help inform the development of the recommendations. And we helped to facilitate the process. 
I haven't been directly involved in the drafting of the recommendations, so I'm going to do my best to answer any questions that you have, but we do also have a couple Climate Action Task Force members that are on the line that will be available um, from each topic area to answer more specific questions if I'm not able to do that. And before I jump in, I just want to take a few moments to acknowledge the work of everyone that contributed to this effort. As Dale mentioned, it was a big undertaking and I'm, I'm really proud of the work that everybody's done. And first and foremost, the Climate Action Task Force members for their time and passion and expertise, uh, especially uh, getting all of this done amidst the global pandemic, uh, as well as the Just Transition Plan Committee members for their invaluable contribution on equity all of the staff that helped provide data and information and resources to the Climate Action Task Force, and especially the sustainability team for their time and dedication in getting us across the finish line. In particular, I want to shout out to Francie Jaffe, our water conservation and sustainability specialist, who really helped hold all of this together. And I, I don't think we would have been able to, to get to this point without her. Uh, the Institute for Built Environment, their team who helped facilitate the Climate Action Task Force and the Just Transition Plan Committee um, and provided a lot of support and resources as well. And then, of course, thank you to City Council and the members of the public who have uh, brought this important issue forward. Next slide. So before uh, um, I get further into the presentation, we do have two Climate Action Task Force members, Peter Wood and Alessandro Branchen, who have a couple of remarks to share. So um, I'm going to pass it to Peter Wood first. Susan, would you hand it to him? Hello. Yep, go ahead, Peter. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for hearing us. I, I want to speak for the whole uh, task force to say how grateful we are to the city council um, to have passed your um, resolution last year about the climate emergency was a step ahead and then to set up this task force. Um, so we're grateful for that. We're grateful for the terrific facilitators and the city government staff that has been so helpful, Lisa and Francie and others. And, and I think all of us were just grateful for the chance to do something helpful for the city that we all feel so committed to. This has not been a burdensome chore. It's been a very exciting challenge for all of us. We've taken it seriously. We've learned from each other. And so at the end of it all, I, I feel as though we're quite optimistic and that's uh, not always easy these days. Um, it's been a good process um, and we hope that you're going to be able to absorb these recommendations. My first thought is, I hope you're not intimidated by something this large. We weren't sure it was going to be this large, but we wanted to get everything in there. Um, we've got more than two dozen recommendations covering half a dozen important areas. Um, but we really think that these are varied recommendations. They're ambitious recommendations. Um, but they're also very practical recommendations. This is not a pie in the sky wish list. Uh, they're sensible and interconnected. Um, and I th think they'll help us all move, move forward. Um, moreover, you'll notice as you go through them that some of them are, are already connected and building on programs and organizations that are already in place. And I just want to say one, we put a cover letter on the front of it, which I hope you'll read, but I want to end by drawing your attention to our comments about COVID-19. And it's been reinforced for me listening to your serious conversation tonight. If the council is able to bring that kind of acumen and seriousness to COVID, I, I'm hoping you'll bring it also to this even bigger problem because when this pandemic is behind us at some point, the crisis uh, in the climate will still be with us and will be worsening. The clock keeps on ticking. So what I want to point out is that we mentioned four things there that we've learned from the 
COVID crisis. And let me just read them to you that in crises, decisive action is best when it is early and coordinated, even where it imposes short term hardships. Secondly, almost all that some groups are set back more than others. So sharing present burdens and future benefits equitably becomes vital. We've talked a lot about the equity lens as we were working through these recommendations. And I think we've seen the inequities that occur in, a, in the COVID crisis. There are inequities that create challenges in the climate crisis. And thirdly, we've seen from COVID that concerted local effort is crucial, even when the challenge is global. And it's exciting for all of us as task force members to be involved in, a, in such a, a local effort. And then finally, I think we've all been learning this spring that planning based on community discussion like you've been having tonight and on sound science uh, can be a key to long-term success. So I would just say in closing that I hope you can bring the same energy and commitment to these uh, the, the climate issue that you've brought to, to uh, working through our, our COVID pandemic. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. Alessandro? Uh, yes. Uh, Mayor, City Council, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak and thanks for uh, your leadership during these very challenging times. If you think that COVID is a challenge, uh, please be prepared because climate change is going to bring more challenges like these ones that we're living in right now. I've been studying climate change for more than a decade and uh, now I'm seriously concerned. I, enjoy, I joined the Climate Action Task Force because I felt a sense of urgency, urgency to act. I hope that you all share that same, the same sense of urgency. We need to st start to be part of the problem and start to be part of the solution. We basically have one decade to get to zero CO2 emissions. This is the kind of task that cannot be tackled at an individual level. No personal decision, no matter how radical, will make a difference alone. In order to generate a significant shift and make a difference, we need a collective systematic shift that involves a large part of the Earth's population. Together, we need to redefine a new normal. I think the Longmont can lead the way. Longmont can become an inspiring model that other places in the US and in, and, uh, in part of the world um, can imitate. Uh, its dynamism and its size make our city a perfect laboratory where um, we can find solutions that can be copied and hopefully scaled up. I think the Longmont has already faced an event that gives the sense of what the effect of climate change will be, and that was the 2013 flood. The city had to fix the aftermath of this disaster. Imagine if we knew beforehand about it we could have done something to avoid the worst consequences. Well, climate change, climate change <clears throat> has been known for about 20 years and is coming upon us, uh, but it's not too late. Uh, the, climate task, uh, uh, the Climate Action Task Force, with its recommendation, hopes to help the city to prevent the worst consequences of a global disaster. I hope that the City Council and the residents of Longmont will appreciate our report and take it seriously I hope that our recommendations will be a strong starting point, the first of many steps to demonstrate that it is possible to have a, a blooming economy and a fair and supportive community that does not to be, to need that does not need to burn fossil fuel to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Who else have we got? Uh, that's it. So you can move ahead to the next slide, Susan. Thank you so much, Peter and Alessandro. Great, and, and as both Peter and Alessandro just mentioned, uh, it is important to take a moment to acknowledge that we are in unprecedented times with COVID-19 and a, a global pandemic um, that's underway. And as you know, this process began before the pandemic emerged, but it's now impacting pretty much every aspect of our lives. 
And there are so many uncertainties about what the long-term impacts will be on our communities, on our economy, and on our environment. And we don't know the extent to which it'll impact our ability to implement climate action measures. Um, but at the same time, despite those challenges that we face due to COVID, we're also in a moment of opportunity to build back better through the recovery process and create stronger and more and we're already doing that and we're on our way to doing that through our ongoing partnership with PRPA and, and the, the commitment to transition to 100% renewable energy and the completion of the 225 megawatt new wind farm at Roundhouse. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of those things already that were underway, um, but we still need to continue to prioritize resilience, equity, economic vitality and climate action in our recovery so that we can rebuild in a way that helps transition us to a clean energy economy and builds jobs and addresses the longstanding social inequities that we're seeing play out in a number of different ways beyond just COVID and that we know will continue to be exacerbated by climate change unless we uh, do things differently. Uh, so you can move to the next slide, please. So now I'll move into the report itself and you can go ahead to the next slide, there you go. Um, so this is just a brief overview of the structure of the report that you all received. So um, as you said, it's pretty uh, comprehensive and we're not gonna go through every detail but touch on some of these areas. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So as we've discussed, we have our six topic areas and then equity as we've talked um, about before um, the Climate Action Task Force really identified that as a critical component to climate action and decided that rather than having it as its own standalone topic area, to integrate it throughout the recommendations in the report. And we'll be going more uh, in depth in equity and climate action, as well as reviewing the Just Transition Plan Committee equity recommendations at the presentation next week. Uh, next slide. So the Climate Action Task Force uh, also discussed the need to ensure accountability and implementation of climate action recommendations and making progress toward climate goals. And to do that, they're recommending that oversight of implementation and reporting be integrated into the scope of the Sustainability Advisory Board, as well as form ad hoc committees as needed to provide technical expertise and assistance in the implementation of specific recommendations and then also incorporate climate action recommendations into existing plans, such as the council work plan. Next slide. Uh, and we mentioned this to you in previous uh, presentations, um, but we were undergoing a community engagement process as well. And the, the goals of that process were first and foremost to inform the public about the climate emergency declaration, uh, but also to obtain feedback on potential uh, draft recommendations and understand potential impacts how to net, medi excuse me, mitigate any potential negative impacts, how things might be strengthened and where things might be missing. And although we were able to conduct some of the community engagement activities that we had planned prior to clo closures, um, and those activities are listed here, um, our efforts were pretty significantly impacted um, by COVID. However, we did provide the results and findings from what we were, were able to do to the, the Climate Action Task Force to inform the development of their recommendations. Next slide, please. So I just wanna share a few of the key takeaways from that process is overall there, there is general support for climate action and, and incentives. And there's pretty strong support specifically for increasing services and benefits for low income communities and specifically addressing issues around affordability. But there are also concerns about the cost of implementation of climate action, and particularly um, how that might further impact affordability in the community. And then also concern around the lack of adequate stakeholder engagement. And the limitations that we faced were, it was a fast timeline to turn things around. Obviously the impacts from COVID, as I mentioned, uh, the format of the questionnaire that went out kind of set up a, a challenge where people couldn't actually select an option where they didn't like any of the options that were being presented. And then um, I think largely because of, of COVID and the impact to community engagement, we had pretty limited representation uh, in the community engagement process. So we know that there are a lot of voices and perspectives that weren't heard that need to be taken into consideration. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna get into the topic area recommendations and just making a quick request 
to keep questions, if at all possible, to clarifying questions as I go through these recommendations so that we can get through all of them tonight and there'll be some time at the end for more in-depth questions and discussion. So the first topic area is building energy use. And I know this is kind of a lot to digest this slide here, um, but based on the most recent greenhouse gas inventory, which was just recently completed and we'll be bringing that information to council in the coming months, um, building energy use it accounts for about 80% of our greenhouse gas emissions. If we're only looking at um, the low chair um, portion of Longmont's electricity from Platte River Power Authority. Uh, so this is, if you remember back at the retreat, we talked about the greenhouse gas emissions based on looking at both the, the low chair, which is just the, the, the power that's provided to Longmont versus including the, the equity share as well, which is the total generation of Platte River Power Authority. So we did in the greenhouse gas inventory how we have both sets of that information. And so these two graphs are showing that side by side. So building energy use without the additional equity share emissions. And then the, the graph on the right is with the additional equity share emissions. Uh, next slide. So the first strategy in this topic area is uh, improving building codes. And Longmont already adopts and implements the most recent version of the International Energy Codes. Uh, the next cycle will be in 2021. It's anticipated to increase energy efficiency by about 10%. And this recommendation is focusing on adopting additional dependencies for solar and EV readiness, Energy Star appliances, and options for electric heaters and water heaters. So this would help reduce emissions as well as increase home comfort. Um, but there is also some potential impact on the affordability of housing, and we would want to make sure to analyze that further and take that into consideration as well. Next slide. So this is looking at creating a committee to oversee the development of a phased action plan for transitioning to full electrification. Uh, the timeline would be looking at um, getting a plan finished by November 2021 and then doing uh, community engagement after that and then bringing a plan to council for approval sometime in early 2022 and then doing ongoing monitoring and evaluation from there. Uh, this would also reduce uh, emissions and have the potential to increase home health. And at the same time, there is also that similar concern around how it might impact affordable housing and the need to make sure that we're focusing on maintaining affordability. Uh, this also could come at a significant cost to homeowners uh, for not only electric appliances, but for the infrastructure upgrades that would be needed to their home to manage that, as well as LPC uh, infrastructure to uh, manage electrification as well. And next slide, please. Councilmember Martin, did you have a quick question? Yes, a very quick one. Some constituents on the previous slide were concerned <coughs> that this meant a really rapid uh, electrification by 2021 or 2022, it doesn't, the plan supposed to be in place by then, correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thanks. I just wanted to get that come. Yep. Yep. And that plan would be looking at a, at a phased implementation over the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Okay. Commercial bench. Council member Christensen. Oh, uh, yes. I, um, I've gotten the same letters as uh, Councilwoman Martin, and uh, um, people are under the impression that this would be, we would mandate uh, having no natural gas lines uh, in, in 2021 and that all future building would have no gas lines and that all this would be mandated. And so um, just, uh, it would be helpful to clarify that. So again, this, this is the planning effort and um... Those are good clarifying questions and um, we have a few more slides to get through, but um, uh, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so commercial benchmarking. So benchmarking is the process of measuring a building's energy use over a one year period and comparing that to similar buildings, energy use and national and local targets. And this program would start with, first of all, a comprehensive um, public business outreach campaign to educate building owners and get community buy-in. Uh, the initial launch would apply to buildings over 20,000 square feet and by 2023 extend to all non-residential facilities over 5,000 square feet. 
Uh, there's a pilot that's already underway um, in the staff from LPC that's, that's leading that um, is planning on developing an ordinance uh, later in 2020 to bring to council um, for discussion in 2021. So we already do have a full-time staff person uh, in Longmont Power and Communications that's working on that, but we'd likely need additional resources for marketing and outreach for implementation of this recommendation. Uh, next slide. Uh, commercial energy efficiency. So this is an existing strategy within the sustainability plan, but focusing on expanding rebates and participation from a broader range of businesses and expanding the existing target of 1% energy savings to 2% energy savings across all commercial building stock by 2025. Um, this would also likely uh, require additional staff and resources to meet that target. Next slide. So similar to the previous recommendation, um, but this is the focus on expanding rebates and participation in the Residential Efficiency Works Program from about 100 homes that we serve currently per year to 400 homes per year by 2030, as well as the introduction of a home energy report, which would inform customers of their energy use and tips for energy and uh, utility bill savings. Next slide. And then also similarly, another strategy that's existing within the sustainability plan, but focusing on expansion of the existing CARE program, which is our low income energy efficiency program that serves single family homes. From the current of about 40 homes that we serve now to single family to 400 single family homes by 2025. The program conducts free energy audits and provides energy efficiency measures, such as insulation, air sealing and high efficiency refrigerators. There's the potential to expand that to include electrification and smart thermostats as well. Uh, we have about 12,000 households in Longmont that are considered low income. So there would be a lot of folks that would be eligible for this program if we were able to expand it. And there'd be significant benefit um, to low income households in terms of utility bill savings, as well as increased home health and comfort. Uh, however, it, it is pretty substantial from a cost standpoint. It's about $4,000 per home or $2,000 per mobile home for those upgrades, um, which doing 400 homes per year would, would put us at uh, over a million dollars a year. So we would, we would definitely need additional resources for that. And we'd probably be looking for um, grants and other things to support that program extension. Next slide. And then lastly, this recommendation focuses on establishing a sustainable climate action fund to assist low and middle income building owners, both residential and commercial in the transition to meet the city's renewable energy goals. Uh, so this is really looking at uh, substantially reducing or eliminating any cost burden that would be um, put on, on low and middle income folks. Uh, we would obviously need to determine funding sources um, for this type of fund and then develop a, a funding plan by the end of 2020. Um, next slide, please. So moving on to renewable energy, again, these are pretty busy slides and I apologize for that, but just showing that uh, without the additional equity share and with additional equity share emissions, uh, renew or electricity accounts um, for about 55% of our emissions. If we aren't including that additional equity share and about 66% um, including that equity share. Next slide. So the first recommendation is focusing on accelerating the timeline of the AMI completion, bumping that up by a year to uh, be completed by the end of 2022. And this is really an essential step in balancing our electricity supply and demand and helping to achieve the city's 100% renewable energy goal. And it's a, it's a requirement for many of the other recommendations that are detailed in this topic area. Next slide. So this recommendation focuses on developing a program to educate customers and incentivize the use of home energy management systems and create an opt-in system that would allow LPC to manage usage at peak times, as well as create a, an energy management system pilot in at least one neighborhood by 2022. Uh, we'd likely need additional staff and funding for incentives and marketing. Um, but this also has the potential to reduce long months demand charges through an ability to manage peak load demand. Next slide. 
And this is really kind of taking that a step further beyond the home energy management system to developing an energy savings program for individual customers to save money on their electricity bill by helping match their demand um, to meet supply more dynamically and where an individual could decide whether or not they are willing to have their electricity use adjusted and by how much, um, and then they would receive some sort of incentive based on that. Next one. Uh, so the focus of this recommendation really is twofold. So first of all, working with Platte River to provide real-time data on the carbon intensity of um, their generation to LPC, and then also in turn LPC establishing a signaling protocol uh, to encourage residents to use electricity during times in which the carbon intensity is the lowest. Next slide. The development of a dis distributed energy resource um, plan includes community solar, rooftop solar, uh, group by programs on electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging stations, and a beneficial electrification pilot. Uh, the program could raise or lower long months demand for energy, helping to shift demand from one time of day to another and reduce the demand charges that Longmont pays to Platte River. It's focusing on creating a five-year pilot program and 10-year development plan to help Longmont and PRPA achieved the goal of 100% renewable energy by 2030. And by the end of 2025, um, have the city running three to five pilot programs um, and evaluate their ability to yield those demand swings. There's a lot of opportunities for workforce development in particular in this recommendation. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to transportation. So transportation accounts for about 19% of our greenhouse gas emissions without that equity share um, component and about 15% if you include that. And I just wanna note here that if um, any of you that have followed this as closely as we do, uh, notice that this is actually down from about 30% from the, the 2016 inventory that we did. I would love to say that that just means that our transportation emissions are down close to 10%. Um, however, it's that number change, which, which is pretty substantial, is actually just due to a change in the way that uh, DIA, the methodology that they use to calculate their emissions and our subsequent proportion of those emissions um, based on population. So that change in methodology alone had a pretty substantial impact on our inventory and just goes to show that the, this process is, is an ever-changing process that we're always looking to find new more accurate ways of calculating this data. Next slide, please. So the first recommendation is looking at a checkpoint or flexible bus service, which is a type of service that's a hybrid between a fixed route service like the 300 series of the local RTD routes and a subscription or call ahead service like VIA or FlexRide. And it's a way to accomplish more coverage and availability of transit and allow vehicles to be more flexible in their routing, providing better services to those who may need that additional flexibility. So this is a micromobility model that increases the total service area in a more responsive and user-friendly format than just providing fixed routes with an overlay of FlexRide or ConRide services. And the target is looking at in the next year to develop a plan with RTD or one of its contractors to establish a low cost test program for a checkpoint bus service line in Longmont. And the measure of success would be achieving a cost per rider that would be lower than the current flex ride service um, that's available throughout Longmont. And the goal would be to transition the current flex ride service to a checkpoint service more reliability and coverage. Uh, but how the tra a traditional fixed route bus service would still continue to service the backbones of the public transit system. Uh, next slide, please. So this recommendation focuses on incorporating more electric vehicle charging um, spaces in high density areas, such as downtown Longmont. Uh, this would help create greater visibility and encourage more people to adopt electric vehicles. And the goal is to install 20 level two chargers by 2030 um, in five downtown parking areas, depending on feasibility of locations. And just as a side note, internally, we've identified a 2021 CIP to fund five level two charging stations in 2022 and five more in 2023. And LPC has also requested some funding for 2021 for um, public charging stations and associated activities as well. Next slide. 
uh, connected bikeway. So this is um, developing a highly interconnected, complete and safe bikeway system to encourage the increased use of bike transportation. It would help connect major, major nodes within the community like bus stops, grocery stores and primary community services. It, it would decrease reliance on uh, single occupancy vehicles and increase uh, biker safety. Uh, it does come with a pretty substantial cost. Um, the in initial estimates are between 10 and 20 million over the next 10 years. And we'd be looking at about 10 years to complete the majority of the system and about 20 years for a full completion um, of an interconnected bikeway system. Next slide. And the last recommendation in this area um, is looking at alternative work schedules. Uh, so developing a program that educates employers and employees about ways to reduce uh, congestion through alternative work schedules, which would help reduce stress, greenhouse gas emissions, and air pollution. It'd be voluntary for employers and provide a menu of options to reduce single occupancy vehicles during high commute periods. Um, the goal would be to reduce uh, peak period employee trips by 20% within 10 years. And the time frame would be to, to begin an education campaign uh, within two years uh, with the, the target of that 20% reduction of local peak hour vehicle miles traveled within 10 years of beginning the education program. So this is particularly relevant given our current situation with COVID uh, and would potentially require some additional staff and resources to implement. Next slide. So that wraps it up for the topic areas that we wanted to cover this evening. Uh, next slide, please. So just the next steps, um, just again, we'll be back next week to review the recommendations and uh, the adaptation of resilience, education and outreach and land use and waste management topic areas, as well as the Just Transition Plan Committee equity recommendations. And we'll get into a discussion about how council wants to move forward now that the report is completed. And then later in July, we'll be taking the recommendations to advisory boards for review and comment. And then we'll bring those back to council for further discussion. And we will want some additional direction from you next week on what information feedback specifically you'll be looking for from those boards. Next slide. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up for additional questions or discussion. All right, everybody, it's 1045. Do we have any questions or discussions based on what we've heard? Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I will make this quick. Um, Lisa, uh, this is a, a potential contradiction between two of the recommendations that I apologize for not noticing. Um, a distributed energy resource list, a level three charging station is a distributed energy resource, whereas a level two charging station is not so much. Um, and I wonder if the schedule for putting in level two charging stations is going to have us oversupplied if we also put in a level three station as a DER. So I don't even expect you to answer that tonight. I just want it to be on the radar. Although if you have an answer, I'm completely willing to hear it. <laughs> I don't have an answer for you tonight, but thank you for putting on the, that on the radar and I'll discuss that more with, with staff. All right. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. We appreciate it. This is uh, this. We did decide this is an emergency, and you're taking it seriously. And we thank you and the, the the citizens that were selected to serve. So thank you very much. Keep up the good work. All righty. Thank you all for your time. We'll see you next week. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to final call. Public invited to be heard. Let's take two minutes of silence to see who calls in. It's a lot harder to stay awake when you're alone in a kitchen. And I wasn't talking about me. I was talking about you, Susie. No, just kidding. You're staying awake good. <laughs> I was talking about right me. <laughs> How about you? I'm hanging in there. I ran out of Coke. I've been forced to take Diet 7 Up. It's, it's, it's not the same. Iced coffee. Yeah, that'd be nice. Or a shower. I'll just take my iPhone in there and just start wandering around the house. Just turn off your video. I thought about it. 
Oh, you mean for the shower or for the meeting? All right, let's go ahead and we won't conclude public invited to be heard, but let's go ahead and move on to mayor and council comments. And if somebody calls in by the time we're done, we'll go ahead and hear them. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I just want to say, go get your medicine down at the Chinese medicine place and go get your haircut at Elite Barber Shop. It's the oldest business in Longmont and they'll cut your hair pretty short. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bonnie Finley would be proud, Councilmember Christensen. All right, anybody else? All right, looks like we're going to get out of here on time. Harold, do you have anything to say? I'm sorry, sorry, take that back. Councilmember Martin, she's wait. I assume she's not waving goodbye. <laughs> you would like to say something. No, I would like to say something. First of all, we do have someone uh, calling in for final call public invited to be heard. Um, and so I wanted to point that out, but uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Lisa and in particular our two speakers, Ali Franchin and Peter Wood. They are have been terribly eloquent. They were tremendous contributors to the task force and I'm just um, completely inspired by them. So I just wanted to get that out there. Thank you, Marcia. Anybody else? All right, let's go to that. Uh, let's go ahead and close first. Or let's close the, the 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 queue. But let's go ahead and hear from this this citizen. Mayor, it does look like they hung up. I no longer see him in the waiting line. Well, whoever it was, we thank you. Um, and let's go ahead. And uh, Harold, do you have anything? No comments, Mayor Council. Eugene, how about you? Still here, Mayor. No comments. Okay, appreciate it. Do we have a Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll move adjournment. Second. All right. It's been moved by Dr. Waters and seconded by Councilmember Christensen. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, we are done. That That's unanimous. All right. Looks like we'll see each other next week. All right, and I'll call you Dr. Waters to schedule a ride and I've got a few other things to talk about with the rest of you. So I'll talk to you this week. All right, later guys, bye. And it's not 11 yet. I know, I'm, 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 I'm tired, but happy. All right, later guys. <laughs>